Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, please, and thank you for your patience. We had some technical difficulties, but we're now ready to forge forward. So welcome everyone to tonight's March 28th, 2017 council meeting. Uh, as we start off our council meetings, traditionally now we started off with the singing of O Canada. So I'd like to invite Sadie Harper Williams to come forward to the microphone and then I'll read a little bio on her before she starts. So if you'd please join me in standing. Um, so Sadie Harper Williams, she's a grade nine student who plays alto, baritone sax, and the trombone. She's a songwriter who arranges accompaniments on the piano. She's taken a number of musical theater and drama courses over the years and has particularly enjoyed her classes with the Yellow Door Theater Project. She performed in the Yellow Door's production of Peter Pan and the Little Prince at the First Ontario Performing Arts Center in 2015-2016. She loves studying voice with her teacher, teacher Sandra Mason. So we'd like to welcome Sadie to sing O Canada. Sadie, that was one of the finest renditions of O Canada. Can, Councillor. Uh, you sing song? <laughs> <laughs> well done, and thank you very much. Well thank done. You. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Wow. Pardon me? Yeah. <laughs> She'll have a full time job. You were looking for a mo uh, an adoption of the minutes from our February 28th meeting. Moved by Councilor Morocco, seconded by Councilor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you for that. We're looking for disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Councilor Carrio. Councilor Thank Thompson. you, Your Worship. On the consent agenda, there's an issue to do with my neighbor, TS 2017 11, Dunn Street Radar Board Agreement with Embassy Suites. Okay. okay, thank you for that. Noted. Councilor Thompson. Yes, I have the same TS. 2017-11, Dunn Street, it's a uh, uh, sign for uh, controlling traffic and uh, the, uh, my employer is involved in conflict. Thank you for that. Any other disclosure? Councilor Peter Angelo? Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, payment to the Niagara Catholic District School Board, 00069002, my employer. Thank you for that. Any other disclosures? Councilor Crater? Uh, thank you. Uh, under the municipal account, Check number 402127, uh, payable to myself. And I also just want to congratulate, today is our first day of uh, live streaming. Am I right? We're on, we're on live tonight at 5 o'clock. We are live? Yes, we live are. We are live. We had some technical difficulties, but we're all good. Hi, everyone out there. Thank you. <laughs> Both of you. Yes. <laughs> wow. All two, yeah. Uh, any other disclosures? Okay, seeing none, and I also have a disclosure, uh, check number 402567, a check made out to myself as well. Okay, so we're now going to move on to our report section, water report, and I would invite Councillor Thompson, or I'm sorry, Councillor Peter Angelo, the chair of our finance uh, committee, to introduce our water reports. Switch seats with them. <laughs> would you like to? <laughs>
Thanks, Your Worship. I think everyone has the report, MW 2017-09, Drinking Water System Summary Report and Overview. I think, uh, Mr. Holman, you're going to introduce it, or? Um, I can, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, with us tonight is James Stika, who's yep. our uh, Manager of Environmental Services, who will give you a, an overview of the performance of our water distribution system yep. and uh, answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Mr. Stika. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So as Mr. Holman said, my name is James Stika. I'm the manager of environmental services here at the City of Niagara Falls. What we'll be going through tonight is just a brief overview of our drinking water system. Uh, we have to do an annual summer report to meet the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change guidelines. Uh, we'll go through that, a little bit of the operations that we have here at the city, some challenges that we faced, and then happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. So we'll discuss the city-owned infrastructure. Well, as briefly touch the municipal drinking water licensing program. It's uh, the guidelines in which we operate our drinking water system. And then a little bit of the client compliance and conformance, um, the rules and regulations we follow and how we meet and or exceed those rules. So a little brief overview. Um, as you know, the city's expanding over the last few years. We've uh, kind of got some new development going on in the south end. So our drinking water system and wastewater system have expanded. Right now, we're about 450 kilometers of water main about 4,300 water valves, so those are the valves that actually isolate the system that are able to allow us to isolate and repair water main if we have to. We're about 3,000 fire hydrants to ensure that we have proper uh, coverage for our residents and businesses. And about 28,000 curb stops. Um, curb stops are the individual shutoff valves. You'll see in this next little picture, in a picture to come, the curb stops are the actual valves that shut off at the property line. Uh, as you know, we're a two-tier system here, so the region of Niagara takes care of the treatment of the drinking water, so they pull the water from the well and river, they treat the water, and they pass on the water to us, which we then distribute to the residents and businesses in the city. The city's also responsible for the meters located within the building or out front of the building. Um, that's the, our way of measuring consumption and then billing back to the resident and or business. So this little sketch just gives you a rough idea of what the city's responsible for. Uh, the water mains in the middle, the water valve again isolates the, the distribution system. The curb stop is at the property line, which is our way of controlling the flow into a home. In case there's something broken inside the home, we have the ability to shut it off and allow the homeowner to make a repair. And then uh, the fire hydrant, as I mentioned earlier. And just a brief summary of what we've done, uh, what we did in 2016. We had 71 water main breaks. That's down slightly from 2015. I believe we had 80 in 2015 and 71 in. Mm -hmm. 2016. Uh, we take free chlorine residuals a few times a week. That's to make sure that the water has adequate disinfection. And along with those chlorine residuals, we also take microbiological samples. Again, those that's to meet the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change guidelines to make sure that the water is safe for consumption. Uh, what I've included here is just a short breakdown of actually the composition of our drinking water system, the materials that we have in the ground. Uh, you'll notice that over half of our system is still metallic. Um, so that's uh, vintage anywhere between 30 and 70 years old still. Uh, as we move into the newer parts of town or things that were placed through the capital program, that's the PVC, the polyvinyl chloride. That's the, the new style water main, the blue water main you see on the side of the road during a capital construction project. So we're almost at half at that point, And that small 4% is a, a mixture of various different materials that would be too small to, for this illustration. This is an important part for, for Mayor, Council, and the CAO to understand what you're ultimately responsible for. And this is right from the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change. Uh, you are the actual drinking water license holder, so the city actually has a license to distribute safe drinking water to its residents. Um, ultimately, Council, Mayor, CAO are responsible for that, for that license and as well as giving staff the ability to purvey that. So that means uh, infrastructure, staffing requirements, things like that, things that you've been doing for the, over the years, and you'll see our compliance rating illustrates that as well the overseer of the drinking water, so ultimately that's why I'm here to, to kind of share with you the things that we've done and to keep you up to speed. Uh, provi provision of infrastructure that relates to the capital program, obviously, as well as our maintenance programs. Compliance and legislation, that's why we have licensed drinking water operators. In order to work on the drinking water system in Ontario, you need to have a license. We've got over 30 licensed staff in environmental services who meet the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change guidelines, and, and then ultimately to receive reports and presentations such as this. This is just our organizational chart in terms of who actually owns a drinking water system and has oversight over it. You'll see the mayor, council, and the CAO up at the top. 
uh, Mr. Holman is top management, the director of municipal works. And then you'll see the rest of us, kind of the operating authority, the people that kind of are on the ground making sure the system operates properly. So I mentioned the municipal drinking water licensing program earlier. Uh, this came out of the Walkerton Inquiry of, and the Safe Drinking Water Act in 2002. There's various guidelines and things in place. Not a lot of it pertains to us necessarily. Uh, the permit to take water is something the region has to have because we don't actually treat the water. We don't need that particular permit. But things like the drinking water works permit, the financial plan, and then having accredited operating authority, those are things that we need to have and demonstrate to the province annually to make sure that we actually have the right to do what we do every day and that's have our residents and businesses turn on a, the tap to have some clean, safe drinking water. One of the things that also came out of the Walker thing for is having a quality management system in place, uh, similar to ISO 9001 or ISO 14001. It's a, it's a way of ensuring that you meet a specific guideline, you say what you're going to do and you do what you say. It's kind of a little catchphrase that we use in the DWQMS environment to kind of make sure that not only do we have a plan in place, but we actually are going to follow that plan, and then we can demonstrate how we follow that plan. Having checks and balances in place are very important in making sure that not only can one person operate the system, but multiple people know how to operate the same way so we have consistency across the board. Uh, we take a great deal of pride in the fact that our system is accredited with NSF International. Uh, we go through an audit every year. A gentleman from NSF International comes on site. Um, he'll be here on site this August. We'll spend about three days with this gentleman. We'll show him our whole system, all of our documentation, and all of our paperwork to prove that we actually meet the, the province's drinking water quality management standard. Following that inspection, the audit, we'll get a report back. Um, to date, we have not had any non-conformances. Kind of sounds like a double negative, but what really that means is we meet or exceed the standard. Um, and that's been since 2008. One last little bit, so we have annual audits, but we also have annual inspections. So those are two tier system in terms of checks and balances from third parties. So the inspection itself is from the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, every year I spend two to three days with our inspector. Uh, he goes over with a fine tooth comb, all of our paperwork, all of our operator reports, uh, every little bit of activity that takes place in the drinking water system we document and record. And that inspector's job is to make sure that we meet or exceed the legislation. I'm very happy to say that we, again, had 100% compliance rating. It's been that way for the last seven years, I believe. That's something we take a great deal of pride in. I know our operators work very hard out there in the field to make sure that when we do make repairs, we do installations, that we make sure that we do th so in a, in a manner that provides safe and clean drinking water to our residents and visitors. So like I said, the presentation is going to be quick. It's something we've done similar before, but I think it's important that everybody understands and is up to speed on what we've done over the last few years and, and where we're going. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Does anyone have any questions of Mr. Stika? Councilor Crater? Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again. Thanks very much. It's just two short things. I did ask this last time, and I'll ask it again. Um, if I had uh, a bottle of water that I paid a buck, a buck 50, or the same bottle filled up with water that came through our system, what's the difference in the cost? Um, the water that would be, that you filled up or that I have in my glass today, right. is tested multiple times before it actually gets to you. Right. Bottled water, I don't want to speak for a bottled water provider. That being said, I don't know what their testing parameters are. I do not believe they're inspected annually by the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. I do not believe that they are licensed to test the water to treat the water, in the case of the region, they're licensed to treat the water, or to actually perform repairs inside their facility. I know our people are outside in the field are licensed to perform repairs as well. So we have a safety net in place that I don't know what's there. Well, it sounds to me the way you just said it. As a layperson, I'd rather drink our own water than go buy bottled water. That sounds like that's what you said. The only other thing was, um, and it is deceiving, you know, when you think about how much money people spend for water in a plastic bottle, thinking that it's safer and they're better off and you're much more protected when we have a, actually have a really good system ourselves here. The, the treatment of the water that the residents get, the receive, the water is treated strictly by the region. They control all the treated water that comes out. And for the residents that live here, it's the flow of the water that goes through our system that we have to make sure that we're not People have asked me this, that we're not contaminating or do anything that can affect the quality of the water that goes through our system. Is that how we're measured on that part of it? Correct. So when the water leaves the water treatment plant, 
it becomes our responsibility. For, for, so from that point on, we're responsible for, the, we call them distribution mains. It's essentially the mains that run down the main streets, that into the subdivisions, and ultimately into your home. So the water is treated at the region's facility in Chippewa, but from that point there, it is our responsibility to make sure that all the repairs, installations are done in a safe and clean manner. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions of Mr. Stika? Okay, if not, there is a report in front of you. The recommendation in the report is that it be received and filed. Looking for a motion, motion by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Cario. If there aren't any other questions, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Those motions carried unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. for coming down. Appreciate it. We're going to get into the municipal utility budget and water rate bylaw, but before we do, I believe that we have a we have Mr. Belowski here who wants to address council. So, hello, Mr. Belowski. Welcome, Mr. Belowski. Thank you. Good afternoon. Your Worship, members of council, staff, ladies and gentlemen. I come here to turn around and just show you a reason that I think that legitimate reason to turn around and ask that this particular report be deferred until I have a chance to turn around and study it. I will just show give you two instances I would say what happened. The report was released, or I think uh, sometime last night. In August of 23rd of 2016, you again had a uh, meeting on a report for the budget. That report, that, that there was no indication that, that that meeting would be held. As you know, I have attended religiously all these meetings. There was a memorandum asserted as on the morning of inter-office inter memorandums released to the members of council that there was going to be a budget meeting. As a consequence, I could not respond and when, the, when I did see the report, it was not a report and, the, and, the, and you passed the, <coughs> pardon me, and we passed the, uh, the budget and the Rate structure. That rate structure, structure was completely flawed. <coughs> you had in that particular year a rate study, and it was released on the 23rd of June. That rate had was supposed to compare, of course, the 2015 with some options and whatnot. In that report, you had a 2016 budget. And that was a budget for 2016, but it wasn't a legitimate budget because it had never been approved. And it was used, and it does not resemble the budget of, that was presented to you people. It was the, the initial part was, but you had a, a uh, great structure that you approved, and it had a, uh, reported the, the uh, fixed cost was $21, I mean 20, yes, $21 for water. That, on the initial rate structure, which was the true numbers that were in there, that was $21.99. This is what you have reported in this budget. And, the, and it has $21 for 2016 and $20.13. For 2017, the real number is $21.99. For the water fixed cost, monthly charge, you had, uh, let me think now. It, well, I can't recall now. Yes, it was $19 and I think 53 cents. But at that time, it was now reported as $19.59, but the real number was $19.86, which totaled $41.85. But you have the old numbers for 2015, which were $41.43. And that compares with the 
numbers that you have for 2017, because you have a reduction of two dollars, almost from well, twenty-one dollars, twenty-one dollars ninety-nine cents at twenty dollars, and let's see what the number was, twenty nineteen. <laughs> I haven't got my notes with you, but it was in 13 cents. And as a consequence, the numbers that are very disturbing, and but I have no chance to go into any detail because I had no chance to study it. But it, as I say, in 2000, the 2015 numbers presented to you were not the numbers that were in the budget, and it's and it is shown up. And I would, have, as I said, I didn't expect to get. It to be <coughs> short, short circuited like we were today. So now I have the second meeting, of course, today, and then we get the data in the, <coughs> in the morning of this morning, and that is not it's a scenario that is, requires any even a remote type of study. I've studied, I've, I've been a professional engineer since 1959, almost 60 years. I've, I've consulted around the world. And in fact, I've been placed in China consulting, in South America, you name it, Israel, but, but never have we ever received a, an opportunity. And I can't see how council can, want, and I've studied the uh, rate structure gone back to 1997. And really, I got into, involved in 2005. And as you know, I made presentations and attended all these council meetings. So for, for that reason, when I saw these numbers come out again, I question when I didn't have time at all to prepare any kind of report. As you say, everything's going to come out of here, even though I have the one eye. Now I just have these two slides to show you what the numbers are for 2016 and 2017. And the numbers were presented in the 2016 are not accurate. In fact, they're very disturbing because they are the numbers approved in 2000, uh, August 23rd. I, I can't tell what this is. The first. Is this first slide the one with the, I think you can see off to the side. I'm not sure because if I say I can't see. Is this the fixed cost for water if it says $21? Okay, well that one that you can see was is really the $21. It's really $21.99. That's the real number. And that is from the report. And the, uh, and the bottom is 1986, which is the one for the service charge. Okay, so you can see why nothing makes sense. And that's why I'm asking council to defer so that I can have an opportunity to turn around and go into the detail, because this is a new type of rate structure, uh, budget, where we have nothing but present about expense, but, but there's not, not, nothing for revenue. And uh, but it's a new style, I guess. So uh, the other uh, slide is the uh, water one, which again is the shows the rate for water, and it had in uh, in 2016 it was in 2015 it was nine ninety-five and uh, nine tenths or nine point nine cents, and. So as a consequence, you see that does not show it's the same thing as I say for 2016. It's not and on, on the side of that slide. I don't know if they, if they put that one up yet or not. So there's the one with the rate for the volume. Is the volume one on yet? Yeah, because it again shows you the big difference. And for that reason, for that reason, I stand before you and request a deferment so that we can get some realistic numbers and have some confidence in them. Yeah, well, I think before we suggest a deferment, it's important that Mr. Harrison at least stand up and address the fact that your numbers are a little bit different. So I'd ask Mr. Harrison to enlighten the council. Thank you. Okay. Um, as, as you recall, last year, uh, we had spent most of the year uh, doing a water rate review. Um, and when we got to the water rate review, we never actually brought forward a budget up until the time that we had the water rate review. At the time that we presented the water rate re review, uh, we uh, as staff chose to uh, go with the water rates uh, that were the 215 numbers. 
and that we didn't alter the numbers. The numbers that were in that preliminary budget uh, that was used for study purposes um, would have increased the rates. Uh, again, I don't know what the scribbles are and if that's what the numbers were. I don't, this is the first time I've seen this. Um, but those rates are higher uh, than what uh, we had, um, uh, what we had in 15. And at the time, you may recall that I had said that um, based on the fact that we were through the year, that our water uh, billing percentages were higher uh, than what we had uh, factored in. Uh, we felt that uh, holding the rates at the rates that we had uh, would be an effective uh, opportunity. We also said um, that um, we would be going forward uh, as Mr. Bolowski had supported uh, a rate structure that is indicative in the, in, the, in the numbers that are here tonight of a 60-40 split uh, between uh, variable costs and uh, fixed costs. And this is something that we uh, had worked with. Um, uh, we had held public meetings. We had uh, uh, gotten in input from the public. And uh, so the rates that, you're, uh, that are being proposed tonight uh, are going down. Um, if we had to raise the rates on the preliminary data in the water rate study based on that, which we didn't because we recommended against it and holding it, they would have gone up and then they would have gone down further. Uh, certainly when, you go, when I go through my presentation, uh, you'll see uh, the, the information that supports where we're, uh, we're going. I think it's a very good news story when you talk about the rest of the municipalities in our region and what's happening in Ontario. And uh, quite frankly, I, I don't think there's a basis for deferral. Uh, what you're basically going to do is just defer another month or two uh, for reductions to property owners that have uh, water accounts. Any questions at all of Mr. Harrison? Can I respond? Sure. Okay, just one fine point. I think. The, uh, that I missed was that the budget for the uh, fixed costs in 2016 was eight million eight million eight hundred and forty five thousand and forty two dollars. This year, if you work out the mathematics, that was the other thing that was disturbing. It is now been down, knocked down, first time ever it's happened because, and it is now for this budget, 8180000 I think $183. That is where it's coming from. And I, as soon as I saw that, I said, well, how the hell do these things happen? That people, all of a sudden, you know that your, your costs are going to increase. How does it, the fixed cost, the monthly charge, now drop down significantly? to $21 for water from $21.99 in mathematics is, or $20.13. Mathematics is simple. For some reason, the total cost dropped from $8,845,000 to $8,180,000. That's a significant drop in there. So there, that's why I sort of say the numbers weren't realistic and I've had no time to study any of that. So that's why the only reason I asked for the deferral because mathematics doesn't show up. Okay, did you want Thank to answer that? Yeah, uh, certainly there's a number of factors that are in and again, if I get the opportunity to make my presentation, uh, I can explain it. But the number of meters that we're using in the system has increased. The also the shift between uh, from a system that uh, was 56-44% uh, uh, volumetric uh, fixed uh, has resulted in some of these shifts. I think at the end of the day, uh, the numbers are verified. They've been put into our model and uh, certainly uh, they make sense. The costs, uh, the operating costs have been uh, contained uh, and certainly this, this is a good news story. Thank you. My other comment, of course, any? I just want to ask comment. In 2015, 
when the, when the mathematics show that the ratio split was 60-40, and it has been for quite a few years before that. And so therefore we're talking about the options were, it never had 60-40, but already it was already 60-40. So now we're talking about going to a split of 60-40. It was there, that's, that's what the numbers showed in 2015, thank you. Okay, hold on Mr. Harrison. The revenues, the revenues that were generated were not 60-40, that it's been changed. Uh, council uh, was provided a, a backup sheet uh, that sh uh, illustrates how the calculations were done for the four uh, revenue streams. Again, um, certainly um, the, the calculations are uh, effective. Uh, they're lowering. We're the only municipality that I know of that is, is reducing its rates. And certainly, I would uh, encourage council to not defer and let me make the presentation and move forward. Okay, thank you. I have Councilor Morocco. Uh, yes, your um, chair, your worship. No, 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 <laughs> no. Worship today. Um, I'd like to say that I thank you very much uh, for the presentation uh, from Mr. Borlowski and his uh, dedication and passion into this that we see him every year. So, thank you very much for coming. But I'd like to recommend that maybe he takes the time to meet with uh, Todd uh, Harrison and uh, go over the numbers. But in the meantime, I think this is a great opportunity for the residents of Niagara, Certainly first is. time in a long time, to see yep. that we're actually reducing the rate. Solid. And I Certainly. think that's great because we've also made a huge commitment as part of this council over the years to uh, put money, invest in infrastructure, and that's part of our mandate, uh, for, um, municipally driven, uh, provincially driven. So I think that uh, we're on the right path to fixing our, our water and making sure that it's uh, safe, but also reducing as a, as a bonus too. So I would like to recommend that we pass the, this tonight and then also have Mr. Belowski uh, meet with uh, Mr. Harrison. So if okay. I'd like to make that motion. Yeah, good idea. Um, when the time comes. Sure, uh, I think it would be appropriate now to have a motion just to receive Mr. Belowski's presentation and then move on and have Mr. Harrison make his presentation. So, so if you wanna make that, I have a seconder by Councillor Cario. I'll take the vote, all those in favor. Opposed, the motion's carried. Mr. Harrison, your presentation, please. Thanks. And I just, before I wanna make, uh, I wanna make a comment. Uh, Mr. Belowski and I have worked uh, um, on uh, water-related issues for a number of years, and he uh, was a um, very, very strong advocate for the rate review and some of the changes that we did make. So, uh, like Councilor Morocco says, I think that his dedication to that is, uh, uh, is, is well warranted. Um, so fi finally, we're here to the last municipal budget uh, to be approved this year. Um, it seems to be uh, water budget season because I know St. Catharines approved theirs last night last and night, yeah. uh, a few of the other municipalities are on board doing that. Um, again, uh, it's based on the direction of the 2016 rate review. And in fact, uh, you know, I say that the rate structure is based on 40 uh, 61, but it's or 60. It's actually 39.09 and 60.91 the percentages. So we we went a little bit uh, further, uh, transferring the uh, some of the burdens around. And um, as as Mr. Stika had uh, indicated in his presentation about the high quality of water that we're producing, it's a two-tiered system between the region and the city. Um, we're going to talk about city expenditures and explain um, how we came up with these rates. Uh, we're going to have an identification of some of the 2017 capital program and what's going to be happening this year. Uh, proposed uh, rates, the impacts on users, and a comparison with other municipalities through Ontario and in the region. And uh, like I indicated, we're looking to approve this budget so that the rates can be changed effective April the 1st. The region is responsible for, uh, as, as Mr. Steek had indicated, water and wastewater treatment plants. Uh, they have a, a part, a small part in the distribution system. Um, they uh, they underwent a, a rate review as it impacted the lower tiers back in 2014. Um, at the time, there was no changes to the system and really no changes to the methodology, and that's continued to this date. The region still collects uh, water 75% uh, on a variable rate and 25% based on fixed, based on the flows of the municipality. It's uniform across all municipalities and the regional rate structure for wastewater is 100% fixed. 
Uh, that makes it a challenge for us because we have a variable rate and we have to predict how much uh, sewage we actually bill. Uh, regional costs are 55%. Uh, oh, that doesn't add up. Uh, it's a, a typo. Uh-oh. Uh, it's actually uh, 50, no, it does. 55% in water and 58% for wastewater. That makes up the total cost. The wastewater cost is a little bit uh, lower. The regional cost uh, was down. It's been traditionally about 60%. And also the region is a co-contributor in some capital projects, mostly through the CSO program. The city's responsibility uh, is obviously the maintenance and replacement of the distribution network. Uh, we're responsible for the charges, the residents, the water and wastewater system. And we have to have it fully funded from the budgets and the rates, not to be uh, covered by the property taxes. The city resumed resp billing responsibility in 214, and we're seeing continued improvements, uh, improvements in efficiency and information sharing exhibited uh, in that process. As I indicated, we did a water rate review in 2016. We did it in-house, and what we looked at was the rates uh, that the city has, the, how our water structure works, what we spend on capital, and how we compare against other municipalities uh, across the province to see if there was a better way to do the mousetrap, because there was a lot of c comments that maybe, you know, we could do the structure differently. And the, and the conclusion of the rate review is that what we're doing is majority of the municipalities in Ontario are doing it that way. There are some that do it a little bit differently. And that our rate structure was uh, for a variety of different uh, uh, categories or, or users uh, was, was in a reasonable middle of the road uh, uh, situation. It's important to know that right now the municipality has 470 kilometers of water mains and 427 uh, uh, kilometers of sewer mains. This is up from 2002 where we had 351 kilometers of sewers and 375 of water. That's significant growth in the, in, the, in the infrastructure that we've had to deal with. So the water budget uh, breakdown as we, as we see here is we had a slight uh, reduction of less than 1%. Um, we saw a slight uh, reduction in the regional charges and basically that is the, that consists of two components. The fixed charge which was down uh, very slightly uh, that was in the documentation that's in the, in the, uh, in the budget itself. And um, the percentage of what we buy in the variable percentage. And we, we buy uh, approximately 26.56% of the regional uh, water treatment in a year. And uh, that's reflective of that. The regional costs were, uh, remained uh, at the same rate of 0.554 that it was the previous year. Our fixed capital charges, again, have remained at $4.1 million. This is uh, even though, despite the fact that we continue to have an infrastructure deficit, and as we, as we look at going forward, we may want to uh, in, invest in more capital programs, but I'll touch why we're not doing that this year. The net uh, city operating charges is basically our costs of operating the system less uh, ancillary revenues and ancillary revenues would include uh, the penalties that were are charged on delinquent accounts, uh, the sales of water meters uh, on new home builds, um, uh, shut off notices, various other things, and and flat charges. Uh, and the flat charges is during the construction period of time. The costs have, have dropped modestly, or the net costs have dropped uh, modestly, and that's that's because. Uh, of an increase in, in revenues in those ancillary revenues. Um, we are experiencing, as we all know, a residential boom in, the, in parts of the city, and that's in, it resulted in more water accounts, more construction, and higher re revenues in this area. So this was an opportunity to come up with the total cost. This is what it cost us uh, in this area. So I've touched on some of these items. The volumetric charge for the, the region is $8.4 million, down slightly from previous year. 25% is fixed, uh, 2.06. Um, <laughs> the, 
this might seem like a small amount, but I'm trying to explain why it's gone up. The audit fee, the allocation of the audit fee uh, for the utility has gone up. Um, we've done some realignment of staff costs of administration. Uh, it's still uh, significantly lower than uh, when we contracted out, uh, but there was some movement of cost allocations, uh, which in was increased. Um, we reduced the amount of overtime in our labor area. Uh, there was a bit of a reduction in the contracted services for our system just by a realignment of services. As I indicated, flat charge revenue was increasing, meter sales. So these are all things we talked about. So on the wastewater side, uh, we can see that the regional charges dropped a little bit. And now, uh, this is important to note is that uh, our, our payments to the region is, is approximately $14 million. But if you recall the way the region does it, there's a reconciliation at the end of the year based on the flows, the sewage flows. This was something that the mayor was involved in a number of years ago and it required the, the region to do this reconciliation where based on, on actual flows. Uh, this. So in this particular year, and we were, we were recipients of a fairly significant amount of money, we set that aside to deal with these so that we don't get into the, the flow differences. And so we are using some of that reserve to offset our cost, but our true cost uh, for, for 17 is a bit of a decline to 13 million. The fixed capital charges has remained the same. And again, like I said, with water, it's uh, looking after a, an expanding system and dealing with multiple needs, and we may need to look at uh, increase in the future. And the net operating costs in this area has increased uh, uh, slightly, and um, basically to, to talk to that is that we've had some increase in the, in the contract uh, area historically that we've identified um, where we've had some uh, um, sewer backups and, and that, so we, we've included that cost. So if you can see, that's a, a marginal increase of less than 1% in the total cost of the system. So what we've done is we've, we've added those two together and that's uh, where we come up with the four, $41 million cost and that's where we've allocated the breakdown uh, to come up with what the appropriate revenue streams would be. Okay, so we'll flip to the next chart. Oh, one important thing to back up, go back, sorry Dean. Uh, one of the important things to say is that, uh, as you re recall, we do have a, a debenture payment in there and that is offset by development charges so that the current rate payer is not uh, paying for that. There is, a, however, a slight uh, decrease in interest. So we can see uh, in the capital program, and we've already approved the capital program, and, and we, we, as I indicated, we have not had a change in funding. It's been a positive impact uh, of the clean water and wastewater fund application. Uh, but we're still waiting for confirmation from the federal government and the provincial government. We, we are eligible for almost $9 million of project funding and, and that we would have to contribute a, a portion of that. And we're waiting for that. And that, in, those, in those projects are four very large construction problems uh, projects as well as some other studies that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And so we're waiting uh, with bated breath that the, the federal government will make an announcement. We were hoping that it would be in the budget. Uh, it wasn't, uh, was, it's in the budget somewhere, but it's not been announced as officially they're being reviewed. Key projects in 17 uh, is a sanitary sewer network condition assessment. This ties in perfectly with our uh, asset management plan to start to get an, uh, an understanding of where in our network that we need to, to, to look. As, as you know, I mean, our asset management plan that we approved a few years ago based on historical costs and uh, the materials, but we really need to get uh, this type of condition assessment and this is included. The water meter replacement program, um, this is an interesting one. This did come out of the study uh, that we talked about. Uh, there was a lot of concern about the wrong size meters uh, by, by certain, you know, certain people in the public. Uh, we also had a problem, we have a problem with underperforming meters. As meters age, they start to wear out. And uh, contrary to what uh, some might think, they don't overread, they don't spin, they actually underread. So when they stop uh, working properly, that's a negative to the city. The uh, large commercial meters uh, are, are aging, that's in the uh, commercial, pro uh, uh, 
properties and they need to be replaced as does uh, the properties in the residential area. As you know, the residential meters started being installed in 1999, 2000, 2001. And uh, so these are now getting to their life cycle replacement. The benefit of this program also too is that we can put remote reads, radio reads on the, on the meters themselves. So it doesn't require someone to go to the site. You can walk down the road, you could drive down the road. We are starting, uh, we've, we've implemented over the last year uh, approximately 240 meters. And these were in uh, uh, mostly accounts that uh, were not, the meters were not working properly and they were not uh, re recording. So we've replaced them. Instead of replacing them with an old meter, we've replaced them with a brand new meter with this remote read. We also are, are working through the CBO uh, to work with the uh, builders to, to now put the, the remote reads in new development so that the, the meters that are going in there will be uh, those, uh, those types. As I indicated, four large water sewer separation programs, these are part of the CWWF program. I like saying that, I don't know. My kids like wrestling. Uh, rural road culvert design and construction. This is something that's been, wolf, uh, we've needed to look at is in our rural road section. And so there is a large project that's there with number, I think there is six, uh, six uh, locations that we'll be ad addressing this year, which will help uh, rural drainage and, and other, uh, other pro 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 problems. Uh, 2006, some of the big projects that you may recall, Level Street, uh, we did a major sewer separation water main replacement in Desson Avenue. And those are winding up uh, as we speak. Another part of our program, uh, part of our budget is uh, rebate programs. As you know, we have a seniors water rebate. There's much debate about you know, our seniors. We wanna make sure that they stay in their homes uh, and we don't make it unaffordable for them. And so um, for people that are eligible for this, the sewer water rebate uh, is, is there. I have to say that we've had this program for over a decade and other municipalities have copied our program, which is kind of a hats off to council previous councils as well to suggest that we, uh, we had it right. The RAP program, which is uh, a program that's not monitored in our engineering de pro department is, a, is an opportunity for us to, uh, to reduce uh, uh, drainage into our, our store, uh, sanitary system and uh, it's an ongoing program. It's a fairly costly program, but, but we have it there. Uh, high water consumption program, this was initiated when we first put the meters in where uh, people that had plumbing problems or un, uh, difficulties that uh, resulted in high water consumptions, as opposed to having uh, an arbitrary process, we, we have this program and uh, we have a few people that have dealt with that over the years. An industrial sewer program, again, this is a targeted program that's been around for a couple of decades with that for manufacturers that, you, uh, that use uh, sewer or water in their, in their um, process are not charged the sewer because it doesn't go into the, into the uh, area. And then of course the low flow toilet program which is we've done in conjunction with hardware stores in the area. In, the, uh, in 2017, uh, that should be 2000, the rate structure uh, was completed, review was completed in 2016. Uh, as I indicated earlier when we were talking about what happened last year, they ke uh, we kept the rates uh, the same as 215, even though preliminary uh, data would have suggested that maybe we should have raised it. It turned out to be uh, the right decision to make. Staff direction uh, went towards a 60-40 revenue collection model, and uh, as I indicated, our actual is 60.9 and 39.1. Um, we've changed... Uh, this is a change for where the variable rate was totally the regional cost and the, and the fixed charges was totally the city charges plus the, uh, plus the capital program. And that staff uh, start to begin at the meter. meter is actually more about right sizing meters, but it's also included in our meter replacement program. The next slide indicates um, what our, our rate impact is. Or, oh, sorry. I got my slides mixed up, I'll read off here. So, the, uh, based on 
what we talked about earlier of the $41 million being the total cost, we can see that the rates uh, have come down. And, and the rates have come down partly from an allocation issue, but mostly uh, because our billable consumption is, is increased, uh, both on the water side and the sewer side. And this has allowed us to uh, project that we uh, would be able to lower the rates. And so we've lowered the rates uh, marginally. Hopefully this uh, trend continues and that we'll be able to do this again next year. The next slide. Um, when we determine the number of, uh, number of accounts, uh, you can see that during 2015, at the end of the year, we had uh, 28,751 accounts active. And at the end of 2016, we had 29,143. Now, uh, that's an increase of 392 accounts. This is, this is a, a small part of the uh, um, revenues that we've uh, increased because of this increase. And that's had an impact here. As I indicated, we saw that the costs, the net operating costs was, was lowered and we are also collecting less money from these areas and we also have an increase in the, in the number of meters. So you can see that the uh, reduction is $1.77 per meter, uh, which is about a reduction of about 4.2%, which is, uh, is a good news story and it's consistent with uh, previous discussions about impacts on, on, pro, uh, on water rate owners. So we, we, used the, we devised this methodology last year. Uh, the rates are going down. Uh, there are some anomalies where accounts are going up and that would be in situations where uh, uh, perhaps a, 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 pro a property is not being charged sewer and the volume, they're a fairly high volume user uh, but in the majority of cases, the accounts, are, the, uh, the costs are going down. Um, we, we've identified three of what we call standardized or at the spectrum residential users, 300, uh, 100, and then the average user, which we used in the study of 180 cubic meters, which uh, when we run the numbers at the end of 2016, it's actually 182 numbers. And there was some debate in the water rate study that we were out of whack with this. And I, it was interesting to note last night in St. Catharines, their indication was that the average water user in St. Catharines, average residential water user was 174 cubic meters. So, I mean, it's within the margin of error and certainly uh, is consistent uh, with that. Um, so for the purposes of our, our, our charts though, um, this is the study. As you can see, there's a, little, a slight error in the presentation of it. The uh, sewer fixed charge for 16, and this is a typo error. This is not a, a any other area error. Is should be 245.16 across the board. The uh, the rate reductions at the bottom are corrected. It's just the way it was inputted into the presentation. So we can see that a, a low a low volume user, 100 cubic meters, is. Uh, approximately $23.69. Obviously, the average user, which is, again, we indicated 182, but we've used 180, is $25.70. And for a high volume user, 300 cubic meters is $28.71. Now, the, a lot of our people that we have uh, that are, that are in, you know, maybe a single spouse in a home that's on a fixed income fall into that first category. It should be noted that in that particular category, if a person is, is receiving a $100 uh, uh, rate uh, protection, you, you would see that number even falling even lower. So it's important. The other thing is, is that a lot of uh, families are, are in that category. So this is a good news story for everybody. So the next chart shows where we fit because uh, the water rate study, we, 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 uh, we looked at a number of municipalities across the municipal sector. Uh, we identified that obviously at the low end, uh, Mississauga, I believe Mississauga has a 100% consumption rate, pretty new uh, infrastructure, uh, and it's down at 221. 
And then up in the upper end is Pembroke at 1100. I'm not trying to pick on Pembroke, but we fall clearly right in the middle uh, with the new rate structure for that. At the next chart is the average, and we're again right in the middle. And then the next chart uh, shows that for a 300 cubic meter uh, uh, family, residential water user, we start to trend towards uh, the lower end of the municipal sector. As we indicated though, for those other categories, we do have, uh, we do have uh, opportunities. Uh, the sewer, the toilet uh, rebate program, the high in, uh, the low income senior report, uh, that we can we can address some of those issues. This is uh, our local uh, municipal section. We can see uh, comparing the high end and the low end. Again, it's difficult for us to project without knowing exactly all the municipal budgets what their average users are because it does change. So we just used it at the both ends, and you can. See you can see at the low end, at the 100 cubic meters, we're, we're below, the me, below the median. And then uh, on the high residential user, we're at the upper end, or at the lower end, I should say. So uh, we're below the average uh, in both cases. And so again, I, it kind of is a comparison that we are continuing to, to uh, go in the right direction with our, our cost maintenance. Could we do better? Sure. I think everybody strives to do better, and we're going to do that, but uh, it's better. So uh, our recommendation is, uh, and, and you have a bylaw that amends Schedule A, so this would be a, a approved, effective uh, April 1st. Uh, staff is continuing to implement uh, changes in, in, with, the new, with developers on meter installation and some changes there. Uh, staff implement a new meter replacement program, uh, which will really commence in full in the fall. Uh, and then obviously we're gonna come back next year as part of our budget process to come to report on the asset management plan to see where we're going and, and update council. So I certainly would take any questions that council has at this moment. Oh, that's great, thanks Mr. Harrison. Anyone have any questions of Mr. Harrison at all? Council Crater? Um, Thank you. Uh, just a suggestion that might have, uh, might have uh, assisted to Ed. Um, I think the problem that, that he incurred, maybe some other people, is we have really made the effort to put our budgets up on, on the website, which I think is great. Just push for that. But in this case, because it only went up on Monday, he didn't really have the time to go through it. I think he had, sort of had the time and been able to give you a call kind of addressed some of the things that he expressed concerns about. So I'm just saying it's in a positive basis. Maybe next time around um, we can try to get it up a bit sooner, uh, not just for, for Ed, but anybody from the public that wants to look at any of our budgets, they have a sufficient time to take a look at it. So I'm saying that on a positive basis. The only other thing I wanted to ask you was, and I think you touched on it, uh, or maybe it's to Mr. Holman, when we put in the new meters, we're going to, I think you used the word, we're going to right size, we're going to put in the proper meters, the right size for the locations that use them. Because we know some of the places have the improper meters in there, so the cost is greater than, than it really should be. We're going to right size all the meters, that's the point I'm making. Right? Okay, I, well, I think that, that the point that's going to be made there is, at the time that uh, meters were installed originally, the, history, the ones that are currently in the system, they would have had to come into the building department and they would have had to apply for the meter size at that time. The property uh, may have been transformed or changed use or something at that time. And as a result, the volumes may have fallen. Uh, they may not be, it might not be used for the same matter. So their meter itself has become maybe too large. And that was part of the discussions that we had in the water rate study. Um, the new meters that are being installed have to be to the standards that the building department requires. So there's there's fire uh, there's fire uh, comments on it. There is other reasons depending on the purpose of the of the construction. What we're really talking about a new meter replacement uh, process is on residential properties about the timing of the meter goes in, who installs it, when that is going on, and we're going to be coming back, we're going to be going out to the builders on that process so that we get uh, a really a, a more clean process with it. Okay. 
okay? But certainly uh, we are, as part of the re meter replacement program, we are looking at, uh, we have a list of properties that maybe have been identified by owners that would like to take a look at it. But again, the meter size has to be adequate on the, on the pressure. I'm not an engineer, uh, but the, the, that would be the case uh, that would have to be on the appropriate uh, line. Okay, and the last question I have is, and I, I know we visited a couple of the homes um, that don't have meters, and for a very logical reason, and they actually end up paying more than people who have meters. And I wanted to make sure that when we go to the homeowners and install them, are we gonna leave those homes alone that don't have them and they'll still have to pay that higher rate because they don't have a meter in but place? The meters, uh, my understanding of the properties that don't have meters would be ones that maybe have a galvanized pipe. Uh, a galvanized so pipe. we'll leave them well, alone. That's the, the rates question. are going down for them too, no, right? But so. we'll, we won't, for, you know what I'm asking. Thank you very much, Joe. I just wanna be sure that we don't have them calling us because we're out there trying to put meters into homes that aren't able to have it, and, and, they, and I want to emphasize, they pay a higher rate than people who have meters, but they want to stay with what they've got. So the director of Mr. Wars is shaking said yes, so thank you very much. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, no, not yet, but I'm looking for a motion to approve the next steps that Mr. Harrison had in his presentation. Motion, motion by Councilor Cario, seconded by Councilor Morocco. Any other questions for Mr. Harrison? If not, then all those in favor? Opposed, the motion's carried unanimously. Thanks very much. I will pass the meeting back over to the mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Pierangelo. So we are now moving on to our consent agenda. I know we do have conflicts on one of the items. Is there anything that Council wants lifted? Okay, so we'll move the consent agenda with the two noted conflicts. Okay, seconded by Councillor Strange. Is there any discussion to the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. I just asked the, the clerk in one of the um, items on the consent agenda is the procedural bylaw, which uh, there have been some changes. So I just asked the clerk if maybe you can just give us a quick update on where we're at. Yeah, yes, Your Worship. Uh, procedural bylaw is also known as the standing rules of council, which are technically uh, what you're supposed to be following during your council meetings. I've been the clerk since uh, December 2001, and probably when I started, the procedural bylaw was already outdated. Uh, so what you have on tonight's agenda is really what I say is a snapshot as how your procedures work today. As you know, the Ombudsman's Office has uh, criticized us in the past for not incorporating the uh, Municipal Act requirements into the bylaw, so that's been done. So what I presented to you was sort of the existing uh, procedural bylaw strikeout version of the uh, sections that weren't pertinent anymore. And because it was outdated, uh, we haven't even shared that bylaw with you in many years. So what my plan is going forward is giving you the bylaw as approved tonight. We will have further opportunity to look at possible changes. I know sometimes there's criticism of uh, some of the areas like the reconsideration rules, which are fairly liberal in our municipality, although the council surprisingly hasn't availed themselves of those that often I did a quick search and we've probably only had reconsideration motions six times in the last nine years and on a couple of occasions they failed, including the last meeting. Um, so uh, I appreciate you approving the report tonight in the bylaw. There will be further opportunity for consultation with council on, on these issues and there's also anticipated to be some changes, provincial legislation changes related to the beginning of the council term, related to more grounds to go in camera, et cetera. So uh, a work in progress, but now a better snapshot as of today. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Okay, moving on to, Sir. pardon me? Uh, yes, Councillor Campbell. Just a uh, quick question through you to uh, the clerk. Would it be possible to get, once these th changes have been actually made, 
to get a copy that could be left in our desks? Yeah, that's the plan. And like I said, we used to have the copy of the bylaw in your desks, but it got so outdated it was almost embarrassing. Yeah. So approving this tonight, that's definitely the plan, and hopefully I'll have those for you by the next meeting. You. And then you can study them, look at things that you like or dislike with the bylaw, and feel free to uh, send on those comments to me. I may do a bit of a questionnaire later in the year as well, okay? Also at the region, we're updating, and Councillor Campbell, you may appreciate this, we're updating our procedural bylaw there as well. And uh, we'll have a whole bunch of things that we can share with the clerk, and then we can you know, figure out what it is specifically that we like and how we want our meetings to run. So now on to Councillor Thompson's favorite part of the meeting, it's the mayor's remarks, they're fairly brief, so I apologize, Councillor Thompson. Could we have a motion to make sure that we follow that up with the region and have a report back to council with respect to uh, ideas and changes? I'd like to uh, know really what the parameters are with respect to what the procedural bylaw covers and how it can be expanded and developed. Yeah, so we've got a motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Campbell that we uh, get a copy of the uh, procedural bylaws we updated at the region, and then we can you know, peruse it for our own procedural bylaw. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. Starting off with obituaries, um, John Tingey, father of Chris Tingey, a firefighter with the city of Niagara Falls, passed away, so we pass on our condolences. I'd like to thank Council Morocco for representing the city at the 2016 Niagara Community Design Awards and the 64th Annual Ontario Small Urban Municipalities Conference. And Councillor Cario for representing the city at the Niagara Falls Curling Club 125th anniversary, the 60th Annual Cario Bonspiel. Council acknowledgements uh, at the uh, State of the City I was joined by Councillors Thompson, Morocco, Cario, and Strange. The Niagara Falls Tourism AGM, it was also attended by myself as well as Councillor Thompson. Uh, the Bowl for Kids Sake, City Bowling Night Fundraiser took place at the Boston Pizza Bowling Alley and I was joined by Councillor Morocco. The Oaks Park Grandstand Improvement Project was attended by Councillor Thompson, Campbell and Crater. And the State of the Region with Chair Al Caslin was attended by Councillors Morocco and Cario. Uh, updates, um, one update I'd like to give that I'd like Council if they would uh, consider making a motion Something I've been wanting to bring forward for a while is the idea of remove a tree and place it with two or three. Uh, I'd like to ask a motion to request staff to come back with a report. I'd like to see the city enact a new policy that would see every tree, where every tree is removed in the city, that would replace it with two or three. That doesn't mean where the tree stood. So if you've got a boulevard tree, and in the, in the old days they would plant trees too big for the street, damage the sewers, damage the sidewalk. The idea is we would place smaller ornamental type trees, but we could plant the extra one or two in a park or a trail or somewhere in the city to expand the canopy. On average, we currently sit at about 97% replacement rate for each tree that's removed. The trees have to be removed for various reasons, age, health, risk, uh, storm-related uh, down trees, emerald ash borer, as we've had a major issue in the city and around the region. and. Southern Ontario. Significant resources have been focused on the emerald ash borer removal and replacement over the last years. Therefore, we need to get back on track and increase our replacement rate. With the standard tree replacement prog program as well, I'd like to combine it with community plantings where we can replace trees at almost a one to one ratio in our city. Moving forward, I'd like to see this increase to at least two. So two trees replanted for every one removed. And to do that, we have to ensure that we've got council support behind this. So. I would ask council if they'd uh, entertain a motion. Uh, moved by Councillor Strange and second by Councillor Morocco. And you'd like to speak to it? Yes, Councillor? Yes. Uh, yes, Your Worship. I'd like to uh, say that I think that that would work uh, hand in hand. We do have a, I think we passed a tree inventory to be done. So we actually have uh, the ability to see um, through, through you to Mr. Holman. Uh, we do have an inventory created with all the trees in the city, how many trees we have and where they come down. and. All those uh, also that had to be taken down the uh, emerald oil ash. Yes, Mr. Holman? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. Uh, and uh, we're just working out the final details of it now. And if you'd like, we could have a presentation that comes back to, to show you how we're going to use that information to determine 
uh, which trees need to be uh, trimmed, uh, which trees are private, which are uh, in the public domain, and to help us manage uh, the replacement program. Yeah. Uh, Do we have an idea, to, uh, through you again, to um, the extent of how many of the uh, emerald uh, ash trees ash were removed, like, or still have to be removed? How many did we lose throughout the city? Oh. Um, Hopefully, I give you the same number that I gave the press when they asked a week ago. But I think we were about halfway done, and we were about 1,800 trees. Okay, good. So I know that we have some good partnerships, like with U-Haul and uh, that. I remember uh, uh, the mayor that uh, we actually, sorry, we've actually uh, done a number of partnerships. I think with Canada Blooms too. There are some opportunities there that they partner with different cities as well. So is this something that we could also look at? implementing or are you looking at over and above that? Your no, uh, uh, in addition, so that's why I'm hoping we can get a staff report that includes communities in bloom, park in the city, uh, yeah. our interaction with the Parks Commission, just the idea to increase our canopy in the community. Yeah, okay, no, I, I fully support that. Thank you so much. That's great, thank you for that. Is there any other discussion to the motion? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, thank you for that. A um, Couple of more items and then I'll uh, top 100 festivals and events Ontario. Very, very proud that three of our festivals in Niagara Falls landed on the list for 2016. The Niagara Falls Canada Day celebration, the Santa Claus Parade, and the Winter Festival of Lights. The Winter Festival of Lights also received a level of distinction recognition from festivals and events Ontario. So our festivals and our events are, are making their mark in, around the province. Also to point out that we do have live streaming uh, taking place tonight for the first time, as was mentioned earlier. So a little call out to WeStream for their participation in getting this up and running. I know we live streamed the state of the city as well. It was a great experiment. And uh, it's nice. We've got co our partners at Kojiko and WeStream for those people that maybe don't have traditional television, uh, cable television at home. Our next meeting is going to be Tuesday, April the 25th. And I call on Councillor Cario for one other announcement. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just like to have our condolences passed along to the DeCosmo family. There seems to be some families in our community that we all seem to go to, all the charities seem to go to, and all the groups seem to go to, and they're one of the outstanding families that never say no to, to uh, anything that's asked of them. So I'd like to have us uh, pass along our condolences to that family as well. Yeah. Thank you for that, Councilor Cario, and second by Councilor Pierangelo. All those in favor? Okay, thank you for that. On to communications and comments to the city clerk. We have four items. First, the Ontario Regional Common Ground Alliance requesting the month of April be proclaimed Dig Safe Month and a flag be raised. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Thank you for that. The Canadian Association of Nurses in Oncology requesting April 4th be proclaimed as Canadian Oncology Nursing Day. Moved by Councillor Iannone, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Uh, item three, Recreation Committee is requesting that Council allow the proposed fundraising activity for the Activity Subsidy Fund on the Gale Center property, approve the related fee, and waive the related business license requirement. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? That's approved. And lastly, St. Paul High School requesting permission to hold a one-day event on their property and waive related fees. Uh, moved by Councillor Morocco, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Uh, with a declared conflict for Councillor Peter Angelo. Uh, Mr. Clerk, are there any additional items for Council's consideration? Yes, Your Worship, there's another uh, proclamation request in the additions for uh, Rail Safety Week, uh, which is in April sometime. Okay, so we're looking for a motion to uh, uh, receive and accept the proclamation, uh, Mr. Clerk. Okay, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo. Councillor Thompson? <laughs> Seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. Okay. So we did, if you notice your agenda, we did have a scheduled deputation, but that has, in fact, been canceled. So we, I guess, we'll move forward to in camera, Mr. Clerk? Okay, Mr. Clerk, uh, in camera. Uh, one recommendation for consideration that the uh, parties from 4239 Huron and 4711 Zimmerman be invited to a future council meeting to make representations uh, on the drainage issue. Okay, looking for a motion. Uh, moved by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Uh, on to resolutions. We have three 
uh, here in our package, and then we've got uh, any additions, uh, additional uh, resolutions, no? So the first resolution is that the Niagara Falls City Council consider the annual SPN slow pitch and street dance an event of municipal significance and support the provision of a special occasions license and to allow amplified music until 11 p.m. Moved by Councillor Morocco, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? That's approved. Second resolution that Niagara Falls City Council consider the 10th annual Enbridge Ride to Concert Cocker Cancer to be an event of municipal significance and support the provision of a special occasions license permit. So moved, as long as you're in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, moved by Councillor uh, Campbell, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? And that's approved, thank you. And lastly, the council consent to celebrate Old Downtown's desire to allow for alcohol and municipal property for this year's Spring Alicious, and that the council consider the Spring Alicious an event of municipal significance and support the provision of a special occasions liquor permit. Moved by Councilor Creator, second by Councilor Morocco. All those in favor? That's approved. Okay. Um, new business. All right, new business. We'll move uh, because our public meeting portion doesn't start until 7 p.m., so we do have uh, some time. Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I think we have a half an hour, so that's yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm only gonna take 20 minutes. Uh, if we have a couple more meetings during the month, then I'll be able to only have one or two. Yeah. Anyway, um, I've had uh, calls from the uh, Coronation Center and uh, you would think that this wouldn't even be a necessary motion, but they don't have Wi-Fi internet there, and they are devastated that they don't, uh, it would make a huge difference to them and their program there. So I'd like to make a motion that we do what we can to accommodate uh, the uh, Coronation Center with respect to appropriate internet connection. Okay, that's a motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Iannone, that we make sure that we have uh, internet uh, connections at the Coronation Center. And, well, what I can tell you, what I did learn the other day, uh, our TV, if you notice, in the lobby is not working right now. So we tried to do something, we found out that uh, the box that provides the internet to City Hall, the cable internet, is not working. So they're replacing and upgrading it. And with the upgrade, IT was telling us, we'll be able to do it a lot less expensive at all of our other facilities, including uh, the Coronation Center. So it's been down, and this will help them move that forward quicker. So we have a motion anyway. Yeah. I didn't ask for membership. Free membership? <laughs> He's already, all right, let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. That's approved. You. Um, I was uh, driving home from work uh, just before noon uh, a week or so ago, and uh, got a call again uh, to uh, come to the corner of uh, Stanley and Heritage, uh, where the car wash there. Mr. Dan Mowbray has been complaining for several years about the speeding, about the accidents that uh, appear there. And these are actual photos taken by me. So uh, this uh, has happened on a regular basis. And in spite of the fact that we keep uh, um, asking the region to do another study to update on this situation, uh, it hasn't happened. Uh, he is very Church's upset. Lane. Church's so, Lane. Uh, Church's, yes. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, I would make a motion that we uh, again ask the region. Uh, Mr. Dren was uh, helpful with that uh, to refer to see if we can't get that through. Uh, to have a four-way stop there. Okay, moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo, that we ask the region to look at putting a four-way stop at the corner of Stanley Avenue North and Church's Lane. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Yep. Um, I, I really uh, was disappointed when I saw in the uh, paper uh, that uh, the uh, at the regional council they. Uh, did not go ahead with uh, the airport issue yeah. and taking that over. And uh, I've been talking about this for probably 15, 18 years uh, to have this turned over to the region. Uh, the economic value uh, for development of our communities 
communities uh, uh, is extremely important. Everybody benefits around the region, and it's the only airport that has the potential to uh, be significant and uh, expand and develop to be a, an appropriate uh, airport for our particular area. So uh, when I saw that, um, it takes me back to the time when uh, the city of Thorold sent us a letter and said, uh, we're uh, out, uh, we're giving you one year's notice. And uh, after the year was up, they were out. And then three municipalities instead of four were responsible for the airport. So uh, I would like to uh, put a resolution forward that we notify the region that we're giving them notification now that prior to our uh, 2018 budget, uh, we're going to make a decision with respect to pulling out of the airport to put some pressure on them to make the move on this and get a discussion. Uh, they'll be able to say some bad things about me causing trouble from Niagara Falls regarding the airport issue, but I, at least I've been consistent. I've been doing this steady. So Do I'd you like consider to the word divest, using the word divest? Yes. Okay, and the reason being, well, I'll tell you why, um, and Welland has done the same thing. Oh. Uh, they've done the same motion. And uh, reason being, uh, if you but read, they're, uh, not, they're not involved. In no, but they're the Dorothy Runling Airport, which is uh, out their way in Pelham. Yeah. And uh, is same that, situation. Is, is that a grass? Strip? I think so. Yeah. It's okay. not a. It's actually not actually considered yeah. an airport. I think it's called an aerodrome. Yeah. It's a little different. And Councillor Morocco is our member on the airport commission. So so, there was a story in the Globe and Mail last week. A good story about Pearson Airport looking at uh, privatizing. And they said the values in the billions, many billions. And they said airports do have value. So we have the other option of if the region doesn't want to come in as our partner, we can sell uh, a portion of it to a private operator. Private and they'll run it like a business. Yeah. And they'll bring in their money. So, so, that, so this puts them on notice. If they don't want to be a partner, that's, we'll find a partner. That's what I'm trying to do. So we've got a motion by Councillor Thompson. Looking for a sec second by Councillor Strange. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Okay, and the last thing, um, I'm happy to uh, say that uh, we've uh, been able to uh, help the people who were at the council meeting a few weeks ago uh, with respect to their spay and neutering with the feral cats in the community. Uh, we are helping them out and uh, they will get some assistance, uh, which came through the whole call meeting, so I'm very pleased about that. Uh, the last thing is um, the uh, Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. Uh, I was contacted and uh, uh, sent a copy of a resolution that went to the city of uh, St. Catharines, which they approved and uh, read the uh, uh, documentation. I think, uh, was that handed out in the uh, information tonight? No, it wasn't. So you didn't follow through with my request? Anyway, uh, let me finish here. Um, I, uh, I would like to uh, uh, have everybody have a copy of that resolution. And basically it says that the uh, Attorney General's office is willing to carry out a uh, forensic audit uh, for the Niagara uh, Peninsula Conservation Authority uh, at no cost to any municipalities or to the uh, Conservation Authority. And I thought that was uh, uh, letting the taxpayers off the hook locally here with respect to that and comp uh, accomplishing the objective of finally doing this and getting this out of the way once and for all with respect to uh, what they're doing at the Conservation Authority. Uh, anyway, I would uh, uh, like to make a motion that, uh, and it's rather unfair because the council has not seen this, but, uh, and I understand from the uh, clerk that uh, the uh, Conservation Authority has already, uh, no, we the conser email. pardon me? We got an email. Oh, you did? Okay, anyway, I uh, make a motion that we endorse that and s send it on to uh, the appropriate people involved and uh, just makes sense to me 
not going to cost us anything, and you've got the highest authority uh, in the province uh, carrying and being responsible for that. So I think it's a great idea. Okay, motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Crater, that we endorse the idea of the Auditor General doing the audit for the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. So, uh, uh, Councillor uh, Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. Just uh, further information to that effect, uh, uh, I received a copy of a letter that was sent to uh, Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority uh, from the provincial MPPs uh, in the area, and they were asking that the same thing be followed through. It just came out today. Well, the letter was directed to uh, have it done through the Auditor General. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Clerk. Yeah, just with regard, St. Catharines passed a resolution at their last meeting. I just received it, uh, I think, uh, last week after the agenda was done. It was my intention to bring it to the next meeting. It sounds like it's been circulated uh, via email from other sources. Um, I do know, I mean, there was a lot of media coverage on this already. Fact of the matter was that the MPCA had already engaged in an RFP process. That RFP is out there right now uh, regarding the audit, and I think it closes the first week of April. So just so Council has that context. Councillor Iannone and Morocco. To that point, uh, St. Catherine City Council believed in it so much. If I'm not mistaken, they passed a motion that said they seek that they seek immediate withdrawal of the city's funding to the MPCA in response to the board's recent action on the RFP. It is a real concern that other municipalities may decide to follow suit with similar actions of non-confidence, unnecessarily dis disrupting funding that the MPC relies on to serve, to, to serve the citizens of the region. So I think it's important. I think we had this discussion a, a few council meetings ago and, and the motion to ask the MPC to do so failed, but I'm glad to see that it's come back here and now we're going to endorse the St. Catharines resolution. We did have it a number of meetings ago. I think I made the motion actually. Um, so I think, I think now that you've got everybody pulling together and saying, hey, listen, Dean's shaking his head no. No, that's not right. Um, what was brought forward a couple of meetings ago, or last meeting, was the, uh, was the uh, communication from Ms. Cridlin, which was about the populating of the MPCA and how that process was to be done. The resolution from St. Catharines is related to the Auditor General's offer to do the uh, forensic audit of the MPCA. Two, yeah. two different issues. Okay, sorry. I won't cross those two issues, but we were looking at an MPCA issue again the last council meeting that we didn't, uh, didn't uh, support. But I think it's important enough that if St. Catherine is willing to pull its money from, from the MPCA that we really have to take a, a, a strong stand. Dean, are you having an issue with... No, okay, thank you. I think it just the, the, the question is around how the money is, it's, uh, I understand it's through uh, an order in council that this is done by the province. So it's not up to us how this works. It's more a symbolic motion, a gesture more than anything. So that's fine. Yeah. Councillor Crater. Uh, the, the only comment I was gonna make, uh, um, I don't think in the 10 years that I was an MPP, I ever saw the Auditor General of Ontario make that kind of an offer. Um, so it's pretty significant. And I'll tell you that the Auditor General, uh, when they audited, it uh, didn't matter who the government was in power, they were very thorough. I remember many a times that they, our government was criticized for the way money was spent or inappropriately or not a good program. I think the only point I'm making, you're, you're really getting a quality audit from a quality organization that has no uh, is unbiased, but I also think it's good for the, I, I think it's good for the Niagara, Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority because no one can ever suggest, uh, there'll always be this cloud, yeah, it's a good word, there'll always be this cloud that, and I'm not saying they, they are gonna do this, but there'd be the suggestion that they got a report the way they wanted it as opposed to an independent. This has become pretty controversial. So I think it's, I just think it's, it's a positive thing to do. And you're right, it's pretty expensive. These audits uh, could be 100,000, I don't know, could be $100,000. That means it's not gonna be a taxpayer's for 24. That's the reason I second it. I think it's a good opportunity. Councilor. And I just wanna make sure that what, what Councilor Thompson is asking for is a fiscal financial audit. 
because that was a concern the St. Catharines Council had also, that when the actual motion went through the MPCA, it didn't resemble any of the eight prior motions that had gone through. So I hope that included in Councillor Thompson's motion is that they asked out a general to come in and do a fiscal financial audit, is what the other municipalities are asking for also. I think a forensic audit right, that's covers the whole gamut, thank yeah. you. Is there any other comments or questions to the motion? And I sh should also point out that, and I did follow up with this uh, with the chair, and he did mention, and I asked him specifically to help me to understand, articulate for council, why the AG was an auditor general was not brought in. And initially the concern was the process and timing didn't fit with the motion of the NPCA. As well, the auditor general was unclear if it was her mandate and didn't give an explanation of what a pilot audit was. But the intention, since it has gone to tender already, is to reach back to her uh, once this first process is done to get her engaged. I think everybody feels the same way, that that would be a, a, a good unbiased way to do it. And uh, I would support that as well. So we'll call the vote then, Mr. Clerk. Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Crater. In favor. Councillor Iannone. In favor. Councillor Cario. In favor. Councillor Morocco. In favor. Councillor Peter Angelo. In favor. Councillor Strange. In favor. Councillor Thompson. In favor. Mayor Diodati. Four. Okay. Passes. Thank you. Councillor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I just wanted to quickly bring up, and I know you've, you've, you've talked to this individual a while back. That's that situation with uh, Petrula's floral design that had the flooding problem. Um, I was, what I was hoping, um, this is no longer in the courts. It's not? No, so I, I know and I understand that. And I had an opportunity to go out and, and visit him. I thought I'd just go, because I wasn't on council at the time this took place. So I'm gonna share with you, um, he received an awful lot of information because it was going through the courts, but he wasn't the, the individual taking it through the courts. His insurance company, had wanted to go through the courts because they felt there was liability. His insurance company thought there was a, a good good case. So they were taking it through the courts. His insurance company decided not to continue on with it because of the cost has gone beyond what they expected. So in essence, what he received, and I got an opportunity, I had an opportunity to look at it, was all the disclosure information, documents that he had never seen before because it wasn't him that was presenting it to the courts. So what I was hoping, that the council would support uh, a motion to give him an opportunity to maybe sit with our legal department to take a look at this, not to decide whether or not um, there should be some action taken about his claim, but whether or not he would have an opportunity, because what he's asking for is an opportunity maybe to show it to council, to show us what he has since learned from this. So I'm gonna make that a motion uh, and I'm making it for the right reasons. I'm not trying to interfere with the process, but after spending two hours out with him, he's very sincere. So, I'm, and I know Alderman Campbell has spoken to him as well, and he may want to speak on this. Uh, okay, thank you for that. So, okay, first we got a motion, uh, seconded by Councillor Campbell, and then Councillor Campbell, did you want to speak to it? Then I've got Councillor Cario and Thompson. <coughs> thank you, Your Worship. I did bring this up. Uh, I do believe it was before Christmas, yes. and uh, at the time, the uh, solicitor. City solicitor said that it, he felt it was improper because it was before the courts. So this changes the whole thing as far as I'm concerned. So I, I, I would like to hear further information. Thank you. Yeah, fair enough. Councilor Kerry. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. I spoke to Mr. Petrullo today as well. And I suggested that Mr. Petrullo articulate the story in writing and get a copy to each one of us. So if we could uh, add that to the motion that he agrees that he's going to try and articulate it in chronological order so that we can all see exactly what he's talking about. Uh, because when he starts to talk, it's very complicated. And he, uh, he jumps around a little bit. It's a little bit uh, difficult to understand the whole story. So I asked him if he would please uh, uh, write it down, put it in writing, and then we could have a chance to look at it. And then whether he meets with the solicitor or comes and meets with us, whatever. But I'd like to see it all in writing. And I'm sure that the council would appreciate seeing what he has to say written and explained to us first. Are you, very good. You're agreeable to that? That's good. Excellent. I think that's a great idea too. Excellent. Councilor Thompson? Yes, well I, I was up looking at the property when all this took place 
and I thought that it was going through the whole process. I know some of these things take a long time, but uh, I think uh, it's been mismanaged somewhere along, and I think what this council has to see uh, and hear is uh, Mr. Petrullo and his factual information with respect to the whole matter. And I don't want to say any comment or details at this time because uh, there are a lot of uh, possibilities of uh, legal action and uh, maybe a, a negative effect to the municipality. So let's just get him here, let everybody hear the situation, examine the facts, and then we can make a decision on what this council would like to do with a long-standing, extremely serious problem that uh, should have been looked after a long time ago. Okay. Councilor Kerry. Kerry. That's what I said. I think said Kerry. The other, qu the other uh, <laughs> question I had was, once he puts this in writing and brings it back to us, because of the possible implications, is this gonna come back to an open council meeting or is this gonna come back to us in camera? Uh, Mr. Beeman? Well, that would depend on what's in That's what he's saying here, because I, uh, is this about the, I just want to be clear on which, which of his claims we're dealing with. Is this the one involved in the flower shop? That's yes. it. That's okay. Um, could I ask that that be sent to me before it's sent to you? No. Oh, okay. That's fine, because what I'm concerned about, <laughs> no, 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 you want to take the risk, that's fine. It's just that the, there is a contractor involved in that. That's why I asked if you should go over uh, He might not be very happy with what Mr. Patrol has to say about it. You should go over here. So I think that's, that's, we have to consider that because uh, there's liable considerations to be thought of there. Um, and that's why I wanted to review it before I passed it on because then it would, it wouldn't be, 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 there wouldn't be a risk that it was published for purposes of liable law. However, if, uh, if council, if there's nothing wrong with constituent communicating directly with his council, that's allowed, but he has to be careful about what he says and how he says it. You so, my question was, should it go in camera? Oh, uh, well, uh, the problem is we can't, I can't take it in camera when it's not a legal claim. Right, now, if they would just amend the act, I could say yes, but they won't, their act hasn't been amended yet, so we're still stuck with the very strict reasons to go in oh, camera. I, I understand, that but you, 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 you articulated that it, it could possibly trigger a legal thing, so well, I, I don't mind council seeing it, but I'm not sure if I want to have that, that out to the public until we see it and you see it, oh. and then that's well, why I asked the question. Could we wait until we uh, see what he says, and then then uh, perhaps I can huddle with the clerk, and we'll see if we can we can assess it at that time, councillors. Would that be fine? But I would ask the councillors keep it strictly amongst yourselves. Once he provides you with that information, then it'll, it'll, there'll be a certain amount of of what's called privilege, protecting what he says when he's communicating with you. He's allowed to speak to his to his elected representative, and you can discuss it among yourselves, and with the staff. Beyond that, I would like to not circulate the information beyond that until we've had an opportunity to assess just whether or not there are any libels in it. Well, I'm not the mover in the second of the motion, but I think we should be looking at it before anyone else sees it, because if there's legal implications to it, we should see it and you should see it before the yeah, and I, before I think that, that would be a good way to proceed. The way it was described to me is exactly what you're suggesting, yes. that there are many legal implications or there are many companies involved. Yes. And, and certainly, you know, as a constituent, it's allowed to raise these things. We just have to be careful that we protect him from being hopped on by the people he's complaining about. Absolutely. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilor Crater, seconded by Councilor Campbell, that we have Mr. Petrullo meet with our legal and senior staff about his claims, <laughs> and also to chronologically itemize the order of events uh, and provide that to council members as well as our staff. Is that right? Does that encapsulate what you're after? Yes? Okay, so we'll call the vote for that. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Any other new business? Councilor Cario. Cario. And then Thank you. Peter Angel. Uh, just a question. At the last meeting, I was asking about uh, our firefighters, uh, firefighters study update that uh, Councilor Thompson initiated a motion. Could you give us an update on where we are with it? Have you been speaking to anyone? Is it? Uh, you were the chief. 
Okay, Mr. Acting CAO. Okay. <clears throat> I, uh, I wasn't here at the last council meeting, but I did have an opportunity to talk to Mr. Dark, and Mr. Uh, Todd did uh, fill me in. Um, the engagement of that, uh, Mr. Dark is working on an RFP for uh, the engagement. It'll be a modified RFP, much like we did with the police uh, consultant, and uh, we anticipate that we'll have that uh, ready in the next month, and uh, we'll be going out uh, to, to, to get the consultant hired and engaged, and after the, that, it will be a two to three months uh, uh, turnaround for the report. Okay. That's it. Uh, next month, did you say for next month? Uh, yeah, we've been working on it. It's, a, it's just been a variety of uh, factors, but uh, we, we, we anticipate that the RFP would be in a condition to go out in, within are, the month. Are we going to have a, a look at what's in the RFP to find out what the guide, uh, guidelines are? Is anybody privy to it, or do uh, we want to be privy to it? Norm normally, uh, I think you what gave are we us asking? A, I, th I think that it was clear with the motion to, to Mr. Todd as to what you were looking asking for, asking for and I believe that's uh, uh, in the motion, the original motion, and we'd be working off of that. Okay. It's not normal that we would come back with an RFP to council to get approval for the RFP. It's usually the direction that you provide to us okay. that we would use to go forward. So then could, will that have a timeline with it? Because uh, yes, I mean, obviously, yeah, certainly, certainly, uh, we don't want to be uh, dragging our feet on this. This is a, it, this is a, an important issue, and we'd like to get it going quicker, uh, sooner than later. Yes. It's just that uh, staff has been engaged in a number of different issues with regards to a number of different projects, and we're just at the point where we're going to be finalizing it. Well, we can't move forward until we see the updated report. So, I, and I don't no, think that any exactly. council members look at it as a, as a, uh, an issue to delay anything. No. So the sooner we see it. The certainly, better, the better uh, certainly, uh, we'll we'll get it back a lot quicker than we have with the police report. Okay, uh, Councillor Ionotti. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I voted against that that us going on to get that report, but at the, at that point, we'd never had the chief. I didn't have the chief behind. We had the new deputy at the time, and Mr. Harrison just said, you know, as he was talking about the water issue, that we're experiencing a residential boom in the city. And I read the articles and how happy we are that that's happening. So I guess through you to the chief, I'd like to ask him if, in his opinion, with the growing development out in the southwest end of the city, is that Station 7 proposed in the right location now, and is the time to have it built and staffed now? Because we've never heard an answer from our chief on that. Okay. Uh, chief. Through your worship to Councilor Iannone, um, having reviewed the study that was done in 2012 with regards to the station location study and the staffing, and looking at... Um, our ongoing development in the southwest end of the city with uh, correlating to our response times in that area. We definitely are in need of that building and that staffing of that station. We're not um, meeting our response times as directed by NFPA 1710, which is our goal at all times to do. Um, so, and the other concern that comes to light for me right now that wasn't encompassed in the study in 2012 was the potential of building a hospital, which is also creating us issues for responses and will create and we can help offset that coverage. So if you read the study from 2012, it said it was, an, it was a short-term recommendation by the M&M group, um, and their definition by a short-term recommendation was to build and staff that station within one to two years. That was back in 2012. Uh, predicated on a lot of what-ifs, and at the, now that those what-ifs are come to fruition and we do have that area completely developed, or the majority is certainly developed. So. Our responses are suffering from a response time. Okay, Councillor. Uh, that's fine. Councillor Thompson. Yeah. Well, you know, it just blows me away. Uh, we had a five-year-old report, and that report was not to build a fire hall, Mr. Chief. It was to pick a location. Councilor, if you could direct your comments this way, please. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really upset with listening to this nonsense. And somebody is going to go ahead and build a fire hall when they don't know what the cost is. They don't know what the cost of the two fire trucks are. They don't know the impact of the budget of 24 permanent firefighters to put, go in that hall and the impact on the uh, annually on the budget for the city. All I'm looking for is that information so I can make a decision 
with factual information, not five-year-old information. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Any other, Councillor Morocco? Uh, yes, and unfortunately, I wasn't here to, to take the vote, but uh, I just wanted to ask the Chief, too, when they talked about the uh, calls uh, were increased, the calls uh, do, and this is part of the um, report, so I was also looking for, too, is to include, and also growth in the Chippewa area is extensive as well, not just out uh, in the, um, the the West End, I believe it's West End, um, of, of Lundy's Lane, but um, the number of calls that you refer to, were they fire or paramedic? Chief? Um, so 48 and a half, 49% of our call volume is medical related. So if, if the increase that's happened, 49% of that would be definitely medical related. It's okay. Off the top of my head, I don't have the exact So I'm just numbers. hoping that in the report that we get back, it also includes the number of paramedic calls versus fire calls. Because I'm seeing right now in other areas throughout the province that uh, there is uh, maybe a new fire station, but maybe not including all the fire um, men to go with it. But uh, they're actually including paramedics to be there because it's a quicker response time having the paramedics right there. And as the paramedics are leaving the fire station, uh, then they're not having to send the fire truck out. So they're kind of, it's kind of a nice compliment. And I think that we really have to look at the base, the best case scenario uh, moving forward in the, in the new technology and everything that's out there. And I truly believe that we, it is time to have a new fire station because of the new uh, updates and that that are there. And a lot of our fire stations are getting older, so I'm truly supporting a new fire station, but what's the complement with that? So I, I would like that. And we'll get an answer just to confirm, uh, Mr. Uh, CAO, is that one of the things we're looking at uh, in our yes, RFP? I, 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 uh, I'd have to look back on the, on the request at the time of the report. Uh, but certainly we can encompass was, anything. Was in the okay. Well, so, it was in the motion, I guess. I mean, I can only speak for the, the CAO who's away. Uh, I, I, I can hear the, uh, the concern that we get moving on this, and we'll be making it a priority that we uh, move the process along. Good. Thank you. Councillor Inouye. Thank you. I also agree we should vote on everything informed. That said, through you to the clerk, we've passed, I think we passed a motion to move forward on this, and then we passed a motion for for a study, can you, do you know, do you remember, and I'm sorry, off the top of my head, I didn't realize this was being raised. What has, what have we approved so far in, in regards to this new station? Mr. We ask, you ask the I'm guy? asking, I, well, he keeps track of the motions, but I'm just wondering. Fire chief. Yeah, the fire okay, chief may Okay, then through you to the fire chief. What, how far have we gone through on, because if I'm not mistaken, we did, we purchased that property and we approved the build of a new building. That's where I'm. That's what I'm asking. Did we approve a build of a new building? Who can answer that question here? No, Mr. Mr. So actually, uh, when you're talking about approving the build, you're talking about approving money, and it's not in the budget. It's never been the capital. We we approved the purchase of the of of the land, but we have not approved the actual building of it. We did engage uh, an architect for the design of the project, and that was approved, but we have not approved the actual building. Thank you. So your worship, through you, just to clarify, um, 2012 when the presentation was made, at that time there was a decision on, they gave you four alternative areas of what we could do and one of the picks was to um, provide a station, uh, station seven, a new one at the area of the Montreux, or correction, um, Lenny's Lane and Kaler area, which was the decision of council at that time to approve that recommendation, which was one of four from the consultant. After that happened, um, the approval was granted through, I wasn't the fire chief at the time, but the approval was granted through this council to go ahead and purchase the property as where it stands today. And then the next phase was the approval to go ahead and engage an architect to start to work on um, architectural designs and to work through the planning and, and building procedures. Um, where we've stopped is we're prepared or ready to go forward now with uh, RFP to build so we can get the, can get the actual um, costing on it. We do have a Class C costing, which is in and around 4.5 million, but we wanted to go out to RFP to see what the actual build cost was going to be, and then the staffing would come next. So that's where we are chronologically. Thank you for that. Councillor Thompson? Yeah, um, I'm sorry that the CAO is not here today. In talking with him, he, as a result of my questioning, contacted the former chief, and the former chief said, that report was to identify a location, Lundy's Lane and uh, uh, 
um, Kaler. Uh, yeah. Kaler. And uh, that's what we've done. We've moved ahead because we know we're going to do it. But uh, at the time, the, chiefs, or the chief said to the CAO, there will have to be another report uh, come to identify exactly how we're moving forward. That's all we're trying to find out here. Uh, when is the right time to move forward? Uh, if the chief says he has the factual information now, that that's when it has to happen. Uh, the comments of Councillor Morocco, I think uh, on my mind at the time, uh, when we made the motion about the medical calls and how they impact and how they can be managed better and how we can make the best decision with respect to how we move forward. And I remember talking with the chief and I've asked the uh, uh, clerk on numerous occasions to get that on the tape because I remember saying to the chief, uh, can you tell me when we're gonna move ahead with this? And he said, well, there'll be a report back with factual information when, and I, I remember his words, there'd be a drop dead time when we should be moving forward. And uh, in spite of that, the clerk uh, has been very negligent in not <laughs> coming up with that because that was a key aspect of it and what I remember distinctly about the issue. Any other, Council Carrier. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The Councillor Morocco's questions and the Chief's answers pertaining to the medical call is very interesting. And I think that we can probably get that part of the equation answered without us paying for it, because we should be able to get that information uh, through the through the people who are uh, handling the paramedics. What what are we being staffed? How are we being staffed now with paramedics? Um, how many? How many are on duty? That information should be readily available to us, and we shouldn't have to have uh, we shouldn't have to pay to get that information. I'm thinking that we could get that information without having to have our consultant get it, but it could be available to us at the same time to have a look at considering 50% of the calls or roughly 50% of the calls are medical. So we need to see, uh, and if our fire department's getting there uh, faster in most cases than the paramedics, uh, I'd like to know why. And I'd like to see what, you know, how many paramedics do we have? Uh, how many crews, where are they? Uh, happen to have had some experience with paramedics just today and they said they don't have nearly, and I asked the question, they don't have nearly as many crews and as many uh, uh, trucks stationed in our municipality as we do fire. So that's why in most cases, <clears throat> in most cases fire department beats them. So I think that we could get those answers and not have to pay for them, but have them available for council to review when we review the, uh, or ahead of the other statement or the other survey or report, but I think we should have that as well. It's just as important as the other. Absolutely is. And I will add too that I did speak with Kevin Smith, the uh, head of our um, uh, Niagara EMS, EMS and, uh, and I asked him if they had intention of building one of their stations at our fire station location on, on uh, Lundy's Lane. Said because, you know, in some cases, yeah, it makes more sense to send out an ambulance than it does a fire truck. So anyway, they were still debating that. So hopefully when this all comes together, we'll know where they stand. I've got Councillor Campbell, but just first the CAO wanted to say something. So I, I was just gonna say, Mr. Mayor, through uh, Councillor Cario, that um, touching on what the mayor just said, that perhaps it would be uh, in, in that request of EMS is to find out what their future, cap future capital yeah. plans are for Niagara Falls, right. because that may also impact uh, the report that uh, Councillor Thompson has, uh, has requested. So we can certainly... I, I would think we could, or we could just ask. I mean, through the fire chief, we could, we could certainly, or our staff, we could, we could reach out to EMS and, 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 and ask what the future capital plans are. So why don't we just make it formal so we can try. Moved by Councillor Carroll, second by Councillor Campbell, that we ask Niagara EMS what their future capital plans are for Niagara Falls. Yeah, their staffing levels and all the things. Staffing levels, response times, and yes. same kind of data. Same yeah. Okay, any discussion to that? All those in favor? Oh, on that, I'm sorry. I wanted to speak. I'm sorry, Councillor Campbell, on that, on that motion. Thank sir. you, Your Worship. Uh, you know, with today's telecommunications, uh, I can't believe that we haven't figured out how to get the right vehicle, the right service uh, at the site. And it's costing three times the amount of money that what it should cost because the police show up as well. 
So I would like to include the police in that motion and, and have us look towards a better way of communicating so that the right vehicle is there for the right reason. Okay, sure. yeah. So we've got, uh, so Mr. Clerk, did you want to articulate that? Uh, do we, so we have a motion, or is that part of that? Did we vote on that part? Of that? Yeah. No, no, we didn't, we stopped the vote. So we're asking uh, Niagara EMS and Niagara Regional Police to come up with their capital investment plans for Niagara Falls, along with their, their um, response times to the various calls. Is, am I, is there anything I'm missing in that motion? Can you repeat that? It's, and a possibility of a, a communication system being developed. Yes. Okay, and that was discussed, and it's probably a great idea with GPS on all the vehicles that you can pick the most appropriate vehicle for the, the call. If it's a medical call, you don't necessarily need a police officer, you need an ambulance, so it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So do we have any other discussion on that motion? Okay, so we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, uh, new business, did Councilor Campbell? Thank you, Your Worship. Some time ago, uh, uh, I asked that the uh, uh, you meet with the uh, major yes. players in the in tourist industry about the destination tax. Uh, have you met? Yes. And is there any feedback that you can provide? Well, what I can tell you is we haven't completed. Uh, Councillor uh, Thompson uh, was there with my, myself as well, as well as the major, uh, Councillor Cario too, I'm sorry, as well as uh, the major players in our community and tourism. We had an excellent discussion. There was a number of ideas that were shared. So uh, Niagara Falls Tourism staff, we're gonna go back and come back with some data, and then we're gonna reconvene and then once we formalize the idea, then there'll be a, a, an official announcement. But this was the first uh, meeting, I think it was about two, a couple weeks ago, maybe? Mm -hmm. A couple weeks ago here at City Hall, and it was very positive. As I say, everyone showed up, everybody is looking for some solutions, and uh, we're just not ready to come forward yet because we haven't finalized that. It was well I, received. I uh, took it upon myself to uh, do a, a poll, a survey, uh, which I will release tomorrow morning by email to all the council members. I think that it's really important in the big picture that the, uh, the industry understand the feedback that I've gotten from this. I'm, not, I'm gonna be the first to say that it's not on a scientific uh, basis or anything to that effect, but it does give really, really important information with respect to how the tourist views uh, tourism in Niagara Falls. So I will release that tomorrow morning. I look forward to that. What time so I can be ready? Seven o'clock. <laughs> Seven o'clock, okay. Any other new business? Oh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, uh, Your Worship, right now at the region, I think that they're, uh, they're doing a number of master plans. I think there's one for how we grow, how we go, mm -hmm. and how we flow, right? And, uh, and it's the how we flow that I wanted to talk to because I think it was last year that I brought forward a motion at this council that we asked the region to incorporate in their study criteria, looking at the possibility of building a south end wastewater treatment plant. And I mean, I'm sure we've gone over this before, but everything in Niagara Falls, uh, south of Lundy's Lane, ends up getting pumped to uh, the high rate treatment plant that's across the street from Walmart, and then from there it gets forced mained over to Dawson. Your Worship, I understand that at the region, you were given a presentation I don't know if you were present for that. Uh, there was a consultant that came in and, and talked about the possibility of a salt end wastewater treatment plant. Talked about the fact that I believe there was going to be uh, a significant cost in order to upgrade the high rate treatment facility. And it would be a little bit more, but there would obviously be a much greater benefit if we were able to build a south end wastewater treatment plant here in Niagara Falls. And what I wanted to ask is could we get that consultant here? to our city council so that our city council can listen to that presentation and then we can take a stance on where we want to be on that issue, Your Worship. That's a great idea and I have to tell you, I'm so impressed. This this guy knew his business. He knew it well. I mean, uh, nobody could fool him. Even someone tried to fool him on the flow of the Welland River. You know, sometimes it flows the other way. Right. And uh, one of them thought they were going to stump him, but he was all over it. He, he knew all about it. So he was very bright and really understood the broader picture of what this represents and how there's no question we have to invest. And he said it's the smart long-term investment is to build a second plant right. rather than pump everything uphill. Mm -hmm. And we're already at capacity in some lines. So 
Definitely. So okay. did you want to make that into a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we invite, or uh, through our staff actually, that our staff invite the c consultant to come here, make a presentation to us, and then hopefully our council can take a stance on it and pass over our recommendation to the region. That's great. So moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor okay. Morocco. I'll be glad to second. I think it's a tag team that we kind of always kind of talk about that when it comes up. Yeah, it's great. No, it's a great motion. You're ahead mm -hmm. of the, you're ahead of the curve mm -hmm. of the flow. You're ahead of the flow on that one. So we'll call the vote. All the, do you want to speak to a councilor? Yeah. Point, yes. I believe there's some federal infrastructure money too, and uh, yeah. I had a conversation about that there is some projects like that. Is that an opportunity that that project could actually work for us uh, and after going after the feds for money? Oh, yeah. Project? It's a significant yeah. project. Yeah. 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 So anyway, that was kind of a, a heads up. So I just want to bring that to your attention. Sure. So we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. You have more, Councilor? Yeah. I do, Your Worship. Um, in our handouts, uh, there was correspondence from uh, a Mr. James Norgate. Uh, he's the founder and president of a local nonprofit, Dreams for Beams. They're having a fundraiser over at uh, the Boston Pizza on, it looks like uh, May 4th. It's $20 a ticket. I just wanted to make a motion that we buy 10 tickets and they'd be distributed, uh, uh, I guess, through your secretary or the secretary in your office, as they usually are, Your Worship. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilor. Uh, uh, Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange, that we support this uh, initiative by buying 10 tickets for Boston Pizza. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Yes, floor is yes. yours. Thanks, Your Worship. And the last issue, the last issue that I wanted to bring forward is uh, is an item that came forward to uh, the Committee of Adjustments last week, and I know uh, Councillor Crater was there uh, as a spectator. Uh, Your Worship, last year we had a motel on Ferry Street apply for um, a boarding room designation. And they received that designation. I mean, there was a bit of a delay in the process, but they did end up receiving um, that addition to their zoning. And now the Committee of Adjustments has received uh, another application for uh, a boarding room designation to uh, a larger hotel um, up on Mundy's Lane. And um, I guess in a nutshell, Your Worship, um, it, 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 it's gotten some people uh, a bit concerned. Um, and one of the thoughts that I had is that uh, it would be prudent for the city to, to have a policy um, because I don't believe that right now we have uh, a policy on, I guess, um, uh, the level or the number of boarding room facilities we should have, much like we did for uh, other uses that we have in the city. You know, we devised a, a policy on, on, on how many of them we want to allow. Uh, whether they be in uh, specific areas or not too many of them in one area. Um, initially, I thought of uh, an interim control bylaw. Um, I, I think uh, with an interim control bylaw, uh, the city would uh, the city would have to undertake a study. Uh, the one benefit of an interim control bylaw is it would stop the city from actually taking applications to convert that tourist commercial use to a boarding room house and. Uh, I think, Your Worship, um, as we get into it, um, you know, uh, some of these some of these facilities are being used for a number of reasons. Obviously, I mean, um, the cost of housing has gone up enormously. So, for people to be able to uh, afford to own their own home, own their own place, or a lot of times even uh, rent at a permanent place, uh, is very difficult for them. So the the use obviously uh, has become more popular and perhaps if we do pass it on to staff or if we go through with an interim control bylaw, we can also contact regional housing uh, and bring them in because I, I truly believe that it is, uh, that the two are tied together. Um, so I mean, I open it up, I know that there's probably going to be some staff that want to comment on it, maybe there's other counselors and at the end of that I can uh, make a motion. Okay, fair enough. Other comment? Yes, we've got Councillor uh, Thompson and Crater. Yeah. Um, extremely important uh, topic, and uh, it's just starting. Mm -hmm. um, we all experienced uh, the difficulty on uh, Brookfield, Brookfield and whatever, but that situation is happening all the way up uh, Lundy's Lane. Lundy's Lane is in transition. Uh, obviously, some of the uh, properties are, have been there since uh, the 50s and uh, uh, with uh, homelessness uh, difficulties um, I, I would say in the winter time most of those properties are 
being rented out at least on a weekly, monthly, mm -hmm. and through the winter time. And it's something that uh, we're gonna have to really uh, have a full uh, uh, report uh, assessment uh, uh, yeah. of the situation to council to come here. Uh, you know, if it's uh, on Lundy's Lane and there's no residential properties around, it's something that we may have to look at, but uh, uh, certainly where there's any residential properties around, uh, this is uh, gonna be a, a problem because the uh, uh, people that are usually housed there, uh, and the region is involved, being uh, welfare uh, recipients uh, to live in those accommodations. So uh, we have uh, to come up with a really firm uh, 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 educated, uh, knowledgeable uh, bylaw, which is going to take all these factors mm -hmm. into consideration. It's going on now, and I don't think any of them in the winter time out there are exempt, uh, with the exception of the uh, first class large ones that exist there. So, I would second uh, the motion to uh, have this dealt with. Thank you, okay. Councillor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship. I'm just going to share with Council, uh, uh, as the representative for the uh, Maine Ferry BIA, I happened to be there at the time that, uh, it was only a few months ago, that uh, a motel, Continental Inn, I made a proposal to uh, go to the Committee of Adjustment for exactly the same reason. And the, the bit of the challenge with the Committee of Adjustment is that, by their own rules, there's a very small area that they notify people. So actually, the BIA was never notified. There was a couple businesses close by and across the street. That's how they became aware of it. And so I did attend a couple of the meetings and I came to the Committee of Adjustment meeting when the application appeared and it was approved. But I can tell you now that I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn that the BIA is kind of regretting that they didn't be a little more forceful. There's some impacts that this has. One is once you convert to a boarding house, you're no longer a member of the BIA as far as having to con contribute to it. You don't contribute anymore. Lundy's Lane, there's 19 facilities out there. Yeah, that they got that through uh, your office. I remember that it was brought forward that they're not. Neither is the big uh, the family resident out there, the seniors residents out there, the motel that. Yeah, no. Oh, uh, the Emerald. Emerald. To Go be ahead. part of the Go BIA, ahead. you have to be commercial rateable property. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like the Emerald, for example, still has an aspect that is commercial, so it still pays into the levy, but in all likelihood, that'll decrease over time. So it's not quite, you know, on day one, they're in and then they're out. That's, that's a fallacy. Um, I hope they're watching them because that's what they thought when I listened to their explanation. Thanks, Dean. Appreciate it. And the other thing is, um, for example, the one that's made the application is right next door. It's literally right beside the uh, Ainmeyer School out there. West Lane. Well, West Lane. West, West Lane. Lane. Thank you. Thank you very much. West Lane. And so there's some concerns. I've already heard some concerns about that as well. So I think Councillor uh, Peter Angel and so is Councillor. They're both. This is a bigger problem than just the conversion. We've got a huge problem with unfortunately homeless people. Many of those people, you know, who are staying in those facilities. And I'm not criticizing the owners of the motels. They're trying to, to continue to operate. But many of the people who go into those motels, that's sort of the last resort. They've actually sort of gone through our system to try to find some place to stay. Our homeless list, or the waiting list, is four, five, six years waiting to get into a, uh, an affordable facility. We just don't have enough. So this is kind of the tip of the iceberg of where they're going to go for now. So you're quite right. We have to put a motorium and then come up with some kind of solution, and as Councillor Topps has said, we need to be working a lot more closely with the, with the region as well, and the provincial government. They need to get involved in this as well. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Mr. Beeman. Oh, Mr. Beeman. I'm just going to make a suggestion, and then with the, I hear the council concerns, it's a genuine uh, matter here. I'm just wondering if the uh, councillor who's made the motion might consider a direction to staff that these type of matters, when they, if they come forward, be referred to council for rezoning as opposed to the committee as, as a measure, which would not require us to amend our, or it would put that a measure of protection in place while the reports being prepared. You wouldn't have to go to the full of patrol bylaw. 
then similarly you wouldn't have to uh, you, know, you wouldn't uh, have to amend the official plans. You would actually have to move down the policy. So that's I'm just suggesting that yeah. I don't want to interfere in council business, but it's a possibility of if we kind of moving council yes, thinks that's an appropriate uh, solution. Councillor? Oh, Your Worship, I mean, I like that uh, on a go-forward basis, but I still believe that we need a strategy in terms of how we're going to deal with these applications in the future. The reason why I like an interim control bylaw is because it doesn't allow the city to take any more applications until we actually have a strategy or a policy in place. That's the reason why I like the interim control bylaw. Unless I hear from staff that that's absolutely not possible, or for some reason that's not the way to go, then that's the motion that I'll put on the floor. Okay, Mr. Clerk? Yeah, obviously I'm not a planner, so I'm not gonna comment on the interim control bylaw, but one of the things that has been brought up to this council in relation to the Brookfield situation is that these operations are already happening. And actually it's positive that they've got, that the ones like the Carriage House and the uh, Continental have come for applications through the Committee of Adjustment. I agree with Mr. Beeman, perhaps they should be coming to council so there's a greater notification of the public, but at least they're going through that process to legalize as opposed to the fact that we know that these operations are going on in tourist commercial motels in essence. And this way, uh, you know, there's at least a process going forward so that the residents who are in the area can come out and make representations. Yep, Mr. Beeman. I don't want to uh, imply that anything the matter with proposing an urban control bylaw. That this was just an alternative that I put in forth for the council to consider. The council is perfectly free to put in an urban control bylaw if they wish. Okay. Sure. Thank it's you. It's a planning issue and certainly a, a proper, in my view, a proper application of the urban control bylaw. Okay, so did you want to then state your motion, yeah. Councillor? Yeah, Your Worship, in that case, then I would like to make a motion that Council enact an interim control bylaw that deals specifically with uh, the use of uh, boarding room designations and, uh, and that staff report back to Council with what a strategy or a policy would be going forward. Okay, thank you for that. And I've got mo seconded by Councillor Thompson. Yep, yep, he's good with that too. Any discussion to the motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Beam. Just in case we're, we're going to be drafting the bylaw, uh, and I want to, to be clear, this is about converting a commercial hotel use to a boarding house. Hotel, that's correct. That's what you were talking about. Hotel, motel. Small, yeah. yeah, motel. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Ryan. So those that are operating illegally as a boarding house, because I think it's got to come back as part of the strategy. It's got because yeah, and, and and we run. There's a fine line we walk there because I know. I know a school that has a number of students who have an entire who have entire families living in one room in some of those hotels out on Lundy's Lane. So we walk a fine line on do we make people homeless? There's nowhere for them to go. When we tighten the rules, we've got to realize that some of those rules will put entire families out on the street. So but it's it's a scary situation. I think so I think bringing Niagara Regional Housing into the mix is, is key because it's all Connected, yes, well, Mr. Beeman. Uh, to be clear, I don't interpret and I don't think there's any intent that we go around yeah. and start you know, knocking on doors yeah. and close the place down. We're going to study them and to go back with policy for council going forward. Okay. So if there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. And that's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Nope. So we're done. New business? Okay. Yes, Council Morocco? Uh, just just two things really quickly. I had, uh, through social media, I had uh, Tina Volko, Tina, sorry, I can't. Uh, see where it is anyway but anyway save the date for July 11th she was looking for council to uh, put a team together for a tug of war and their event goes towards project share but I'm going to ask her to come and make a presentation so that they can tell us what they what their event does and a second uh, very quickly is that I uh, would just like to follow up I had someone else uh, social through so social media ask about McLeod Road and Hexamar and a light that we've talked about many times before going there and I think it's the region, but uh, yeah. the region actually, I think, did a study a few years ago and said it didn't uh, warrant a crosswalk. A, a crosswalk and a light. Yeah. A light. And I think somebody else has brought that up There's too. So up if we could maybe have that looked at again, uh, taken back to the region. So I'd like to have a motion to have that looked at again from the club. It's near the school. Is it Hexma or? Okay. Uh -huh. Well, well and, and I don't know. It was approved. It was approved in the budget. Yeah, it was our approved. Yeah. So it was approved in the budget. Our contribution. Marzana, do you have any update on uh, our knowledge of that? The crosswalk on Cloud Road. Yes, Chair. Um, 
We actually sent an email to the region just asking the status of that just um, approximately a month ago. We haven't heard anything back. But initially back in October, there were some new criteria that came out with respect to crosswalks. And we asked the region to review that location to see whether the new criteria for the crosswalks would, would apply there. So we're waiting for that response. So we're hoping to either get one of the new standard crosswalks installed there or possibly, if need be, a traffic signal. So we're not sure which one it would be at this point. Okay, so it's in, and I know Regional Councilor Selena about Patty is here too, so I'm sure that she'll take that concern on just to follow up for us as well. Um, so anyway, thank you, Marzana. Thank, thank you very you. much. All right, thank you for that. Okay, so now we will get back to the planning matters on council. So Mr. Clerk, would you please introduce the next item on the agenda? Your Worship, a public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's official plan and zoning bylaws to permit a car wash on the north side of McLeod Road west of Sharon Avenue. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Friday, February 24, 2017 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendments to participate in any site plan process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I'll now ask our Director of Planning, Mr. Hurlovich, to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Uh, thank you, Worship. This uh, application is um, for a property on the north side of McLeod Road. It's um, about 1114 square meters or 0.27 of an acre in size. It's two residential lots. Uh, the property immediately to the west, I'm gonna flip back to the air photo. I think it's a little cle clearer to see here. So the properties to the west are single family detached dwellings. To the north are single detached dwellings. The east of the property is a church parking lot, and the church is right at the corner of McLeod Road and Sharon. Uh, south across McLeod Road is uh, basically kind of southwest is the Kojiko building, and then there are commercial plazas immediately across, and then uh, a number of other uh, detached residential um, dwellings on the south side of McLeod Road as well. So that sets the context uh, for this uh, application and again this is just basically depicts the same thing the site plan for the property then is to take those uh, two residential lots and to um, request an official plan amendment and a zoning amendment the ultimate plan then would be to place a three bay manual car wash uh, towards the back of the property uh, they're proposing two driveway accesses onto uh, McLeod Road, McLeod's a regional road. Um, the, uh, and they're seeking a number of variances. The uh, city zoning bylaw has special provisions for car washes, and so there are increased standards uh, for a typical car wash that establishes in the city, and so they're seeking a number of variations from those standards. So uh, they're requesting a reduced rear yard down to 2.1 meters. Uh, a reduced uh, landscaped area of 14%, reduced interior side yard of 1.5 meters on the west side. Uh, they're reducing the number of car sp uh, stacking spaces. So our typical standard is to allow for four cars to be stacked in a row to enter a bay uh, for your self-serve car wash. Uh, so they have two uh, stacking areas for each of the three bays. Uh, the lot depth for a car wash, uh, the standard I think is 38 meters, they have 34 meters, and they're looking for a reduced uh, street frontage as well of uh, 30.48 meters. Um, so those are the variations from the, uh, the standard. Um, the background behind this, again, they put, want to construct a three bay car wash. The lands are designated residential. The applicant is seeking a special policy to the residential designation to permit commercial uses, uh, you know, with the exception of the typical residential policies. The lands are zoned institutional. They were once part of the church property, 
uh, but we were uh, severed a number of years ago. And as I mentioned, the applicant is seeking some specific uh, zoning amendments. Uh, so this, in uh, planning's opinion, will introduce a commercial use into McLeod Road or onto McLeod Road where no commercial use was intended. Doesn't represent a logical extension of a commercial area. The uh, proposal is actually um, disorderly in terms of compatibility with the uh, adjacent land uses. Uh, I know there's a letter in your package that was received from the uh, applicant's uh, planner who suggested the church is not uh, residential use when in actual fact our official plan recognizes churches and in institutional uses that are uh, serve the residential uh, population as being compatible with residential areas. Uh, the site is undersized uh, and that's evidenced by the fact that they need, need a number of uh, uh, special provisions to the zoning and uh, the lands have been identified in our official plan as a residential intensification corridor. This is done in order to comply with the province's growth plan that we uh, make accommodation to uh, use our urban lands more efficiently for residential purposes. Um, the zoning bylaw under those intensification um, policies could accommodate a four to six unit uh, apartment building. So if you imagine something like a fourplex or a, a sixplex on the property, um, that could be accommodated within those density provisions. The zoning requested is not uh, supported because of the reductions to rear yard depth, uh, side yard, um, really bring that um, commercial business closer to the housing than we think is appropriate. As I mentioned, our typical standards uh, for car washers are higher than just a typical commercial use. Um, the, uh, but in the event that if council should decide that they wish to uh, grant this, then we would require or recommend that we require noise attenuation fencing along those edges to protect uh, the residents. Um, we did have a uh, neighborhood meeting. We've had the neighbors come out uh, and have expressed concern about um, the noise that they might uh, expect. And it would also be necessary to uh, have those lots deemed not to be lots in a plan of subdivision so that they could operate as one parcel. Uh, therefore, staff is, uh, does not find that this is a logical extension of a commercial node. The lands are uh, uh, insufficiently sized to accommodate the use. The lands uh, would be more appropriately developed for a multiple unit residential uh, dwelling as envisioned by the official plan. So the staff's recommendation is that council deny the official plan amendment, deny the zoning bylaw amendment, um, and that uh, they not allow the Bay manual car wash. Those are the highlights. Thank you, Mr. Herlovich. Any questions or comments of Mr. Herl from Mr. Herlovich of Council? Okay, seeing none, members of the public are advised that a failure to make, make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing any referral that it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheets will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 1724 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Is there anyone here other than the applicant? Yes, you can step forward to the microphone, please. You can just state your name and your address, please. Susan Rogers, 7149 McLeod Road. Thank you. Sorry about the apparel, but it's game day. <laughs> I'm a Habs fan, so uh, sorry. <laughs> Watch it. <laughs> uh, good evening, Your Worship and members of City Council. My name is Susan Rogers. I presently reside at 7149 McLeod Road and have lived here for almost 21 years. I am speaking tonight in opposition of the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment for lot 79 and 80 on McLeod Road. I agree with the oppositions made to the council by the various city departments. I will present three points. First, the lot cannot support additional traffic flow and noise according to recommendations by transportation services and parks design. Second, the two lots are in a subdivision plan and cannot be joined without a necessary bylaw change. 
Third, even if we accept the current size of the lots as appropriate, the proposed size by the developer is overestimated due to the presence of an easement between an adjacent lot. The Regional Municipality of Niagara recommended that a noise study be conducted and a road widening with a width to be determined by regional staff be dedicated as the site plan, at the site, at the plan stage, sorry. Transportation Services has advised that the current configuration of the queuing spaces cannot be supported by Transportation Services staff. They recommend that the westerly access be closed, the queuing spaces be oriented in an east to west direction, and turning templates be applied to ensure vehicles can navigate the revised configuration. Parks Design proposes increased rear and side yard buffers for the development. They also recommend noise attenuation buffer treatments along the abutting res residential properties should be considered. Seven letters of objection were received from surrounding residents. These letters cite concerns about the potential 24-hour operation of the facility, noise, visual and lighting impacts, and the potential of increased traffic accidents on McLeod Road as a result of the facility. The applicant claims that the lands are not appropriate for single detached dwellings due to their location on a busy arterial road. I take offense to their clear disdain for the current residents of the area. I have personally lived in this location with my family for over 20 years and I am confident that other residents have similar feelings. Without significant additional investment and changes, the lands are undersized for the suggested zoning change and that the requested zoning regulation changes cannot be supported. Please refer to the zone regulations on page 5 of the report you received. The two lots are full lots in a plan of subdivision and they cannot be merged without the passage of a bylaw to deem the lots not to be in a plan of subdivision. I also understand that the applicant is considering an apartment building on this land if the car wash is not approved. Would this not mean the merging of the two properties as well in order to accommodate an apartment? One last point, a question that was asked last June at the neighborhood open house was never answered regarding the six foot bell easement on the west side of lot 79 and 80, which is right next to our driveway, which cannot support the development of any permanent structures, including pavement. This then makes the lots even smaller with regards to zone regulations. I would expect that the applicant's planner has looked into this discrepancy and may have an answer now. Thank you for your time, and I believe the right decisions will be made by the council for this property in the best interests of the residents and the city of Niagara Falls. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else other than the applicant who wishes to address council? Okay. Council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Is this where I? Yeah, if you okay. pick either microphone. Okay, and um, my name is Tom Vadavaz. I'm the applicant. Uh, my son Christian. He's gonna he's gonna take care of the. Uh, the computer um, uh, moving the uh, moving the um, presentation on, but um, I'm going to start off by um, by getting into uh, number one, looking at the cloud road as a whole. Okay, so look, okay, and I'm going to give you some facts. One of the so I'm going to present you with a bunch of these facts. One of the, this is one of the busiest streets in Niagara Falls. Okay, we're not going to uh, we're not going to dispute that. It is a very very busy 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 road, and this is due to the population expansion on the west side of the QEW. Also, that there is shopping on on the east side, uh, which includes Canadian Tire, uh, Food Basics, and some commercial uh, mini malls. Number three, uh, it is one of the main arteries leading to the Casino Niagara, Marine and, and uh, Marine and, and Game Farms. So there's a lot of traffic going, uh, going easterly on McLeod Road from the QEW. Um, the neighbors will be glad to hear that um, in the near future, this is being taken under consideration by the region that um, the road may be, wi may be widened. 
okay? Um, I spoke with Region, and they are considering, and they're at their preliminary stages at considering widening the road. So that would actually mean uh, they are considering, when I spoke to them, that there may be a traffic light at the uh, corner of, I think it's Sharon and McLeod Road, which is the corner of where the church is. Um, there may be a, there, there may be consideration for a, a center lane. And that in fact would actually mean that some more lands would be taken off both sides of the street. Okay, now th that's not a good thing for the residents of, of McLeod Road because already it's one of the noisiest streets in Niagara Falls. Okay, and I will show you some facts and figures uh, that will show you that as well. Okay, McLeod Road is, like I said, the noisiest, uh, one of the noisiest roads and will continue with more traffic because of surrounding population growth. Uh, I don't think the residents of uh, McLeod Road, uh, they wouldn't agree with that. It, it, it's getting busier and it's getting louder and, and will uh, continue to do so in years to come. Um, as far as um, multi-family uh, dwellings being constructed, uh, on the Cloud Road, nothing, uh, of, no residence has been uh, built from the QEW, uh, multifamily dwellings have been built from the QEW to, to almost um, a Drummond Road, except for the huge apartment buildings uh, located at 6515 and 6601 uh, McLeod Road, which are these huge apartments that have 15 plus apartments in them. When the pa within the past 30 years, you know, there has not been anything but commercial buildings built between the QEW and uh, Dorchester Road. There has been only commercial from Canadian Tire to the, uh, there's a muffler man, a car shop, there's a, there's a, a strip mall, there's A&W, okay, and, uh, and a couple more, McDonald's, so forth and so on. So now we're gonna get into the uh, visual aspect of this presentation. Okay, so this is the, um, uh, this is the uh, property and this is what's being proposed, a three bay car wash with the uh, vacuum cleaners located to the right, right of it, okay, there's a, uh, I'm proposing to have quite a large fence uh, put on the property and, uh, and you can see the kind of trees that are being considered. Um, there it is again, the uh, three vacuums. Now in this picture, I have uh, the adjoining property on the, uh, on the left, uh, which is a residential property owned by the Rogers. And in the back, you can actually, see, I put in this picture some garages that are in the backyards of the people living uh, on Ann Street. Okay, there was a meeting held, I think, uh, June the 21st, and some of the, uh, some of the residents of, on Ann Street and McLeod Road had concerns, okay? They had concerns, and I felt it very important to address these concerns, and, and that's why I'm here, okay? Because I have looked at all these concerns and I've taken them to heart. So the concerns were noise, traffic, nighttime equipment, vacuums, lighting, obviously loitering and uh, the traffic circulation. So we're gonna go into that uh, point by point. This is the, um, this is the uh, property in question. So I want you to get a feel of how, this, how the lands, the surrounding lands are uh, in relation to this property. So we're gonna do a little uh, a droning and we're going to show you in fact what exists on on the lands to the east and the west of this so right across the street here is a neighborhood <coughs> commercial okay it's a mall that's uh, being occupied by uh, by many uh, many little uh, retail stores. The Kojiko building, the Kojiko building is right there. There's a parking area. This is the uh, neighborhood commercial. Then there's three houses over here. I have uh, been in correspondence with the, uh, the person who actually owns all three houses. 
Okay, so um, in fact, the person who owns all three houses is kind of waiting to see what's going to happen today, okay? Because they, their intent is to hopefully go into a commercial use, but everything is pending on you know, the outcomes of things that are going to happen. Yeah. So let's continue on. Okay, so this gives you a feel of exactly what we're looking at when we look across the street. You know, we are looking at commercial, we're not looking at residential. <laughs> that's not residential, that's commercial again. Uh, a little further is the, um, is the uh, um, fire station. Now we're going from Dorchester Road, there's a Canadian tire on the left. Okay, to the right is your, is your uh, gas station. You cross the road and there's a, uh, there we go, we got general commercial, uh, uh, there's a car sales. On the left, there's a, again, a Tim Hortons donut, um, uh, uh, Tim Hortons, uh, Wendy's. We go a little further, we get into uh, A&W, a huge strip mall, uh, and then there's the um, fire station. Is this all done by drone? Yes, I did it by drone, yes. That's a little unnerving. Okay, <laughs> can you stop it? Excuse me? That's a little unnerving. Yes. Okay, so we're, we're, we're coming up to, um, to my land, but on the left, again, like I said, the fire station, we've got the church, and then we have those houses, those transitional residential multi-zone houses that are, are, are ba basically being left and await future uh, development. Neighborhood commercial on the, uh, right across, again, the parking lot, light industrial, and then we have four houses. Okay. Now this is where the the uh, this is uh, where the proposed car wash is going to be sitting on the, on these lands in relation to the rest of the houses. Now we're going to get back to this picture because this picture is really important because of the buffers and everything that are going to be incorporated in relationship to the neighbors, and the neighbors need to know this. Continue. Here we are at the QEW, we're working our way into the property and uh, to the right, there's McDonald's, there's a gas station and uh, there's Walmart to the right of that. We're, cro we're crossing over uh, the, canal, uh, the canal tunnel there and here again, this is what exists. From the opposite direction. I can uh, I, I can definitely appreciate the um, the concerns the neighbors have with the noise, and uh, that to me is important as well because I certainly wouldn't want to uh, have more noise than I need to have. Okay, so there we are with that part of it. Okay, so, we, so I did a noise study. And I did a noise study because I think this was one of the greatest concerns the neighbors had. So I decided, you know what? I've got to do a noise study. I've got to figure this out and I've got to see in fact how much noise is actually being generated out there. And what I did is I went to other car washes, okay? So this is one car wash that I went to and uh, and I did a noise study on the vacuums. In fact, this is a car wash that's located on Drummond and uh, I think it's Scott Street. And um, this car wash, uh, you can actually drive right to the back and there's a house to the back and there's vacuums 
vacuum cleaners located to the right. And from those vacuum cleaners, there is residential housing located uh, uh, to the right of that, which is approximately 113 feet away. Okay, so I started doing noise studies. I, um, I took a reading at the vacuum cleaner that you see at the side of the building, and uh, I came up with 83 decibels, and uh, then I went to the corner of the house and I had a reading of 64.6 decibels. Continue on to the next one. Okay, you'll, no you'll notice on that picture as well that there were, no, there were no barriers, okay? There was no barriers from the vacuum cleaners to that house. Okay, so there was no allowance for a barrier. Okay, so next one. Then I, then there's another vacuum cleaner that was uh, located about 20 feet away. Again, we had a reading of about 83 decibels. As we got to 25 feet, 50 feet, and to the house, which was about, uh, I think it was about 97 feet, we came up with 83 decibels again at the vacuum, at 25 feet, 69, at 50 feet, 62, and at the 100 feet, 60 decibels, okay? So there we are. I also went into that car wash because unlike other typical car wash, you could actually drive right through this one. Okay, so I went into the car wash, I took a reading and I got 80 decibels. Again, there's no, there's no fencing or buffers. I came up with 64, uh, 65 decibels at the house. I then went to the uh, car wash located on Dorchester and Crop Street. Okay, I did the exact same thing. You'll notice that on the right, there's a lot of cars there. Uh, there's not cars, there's a lot of houses there, excuse me. And, um, and uh, they are approximately 113 feet away from the vacuums that exist on the side of the building. So again, these these vacuums, this vacuum was actually louder than the other vacuum. It gave off 93.5 decibels. And at 25 feet, 50 feet, and secondly, uh, 100 feet and 113 feet, those are the readings. Okay, so 71 at 25, okay. But the most important one I want you to take in consideration is the one at 100 feet, which is 61 decibels, and the one at the very front of the house, which is 60 decibels. We'll get back to that. So there's the readings. Okay, then I went to my property, okay? This is very important. I mean, this is really important, this aspect of it. I went and I took readings from the, the curb of the road. Go ahead. Okay, so reading, uh, reading number 13, from the curb of the road to the front of all those properties that are lined up on McLeod Road, they are 50 feet back. Okay, the decibel readings are 70 decibels. Okay, that is huge. That is very loud, okay? And at the back of the property, the decibel reading is 62 decibels. That means that, means that every time a car drives by, you're getting 70 decibels. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go to the next one. So then I did a comparison study, okay? And when I did a comparison study, I can hardly see that. When I did a comparison study, the, the reading that we need to take in consideration is that when we look at number 13 reading, which is 50 feet, we're getting 70 decibels. The vacuums that I am proposing to install are going to be from the neighboring house, uh, which is the Rogers house, which is, hold on. Which is uh, 7149 to the left of the car wash, if I'm looking at, this, looking at the uh, car wash. That, that reading, so they're getting 50, uh, uh, 70 decibels from the street to the house. From my, from my proposed uh, vacuum cleaner locations, you are approximately 80 feet away without any barriers taken in consider, consideration from the house, the corner of the house to the vacuum, 
with no barriers is approximately 70 to 80 feet. So if you start looking at the readings of the vacuums and you go between 50 and 97 feet between reading four and five, you're gonna get about 61, 62 decibels. And if you take it, uh, if you go between reading uh, 10 and 11, uh, you're gonna be again at about the 64, 65 decibel uh, reading on a vacuum when it's running. We're not taking any barriers in consideration here either, okay? So, okay? So that means that, that the traffic on that street is giving off more noise than any vacuum cleaner could ever give off, okay? So every car that drives by there, okay, there may be shorter, smaller readings of 60. If you notice that when you see reading uh, 13, it may go down as low as 63, but it can go higher than 70, okay? Now, if we now start taking roads, uh, uh, start taking road away from that, the, the houses will even be closer to the road and the, the readings will even be higher, okay? So I needed to bring that point up because this is what we're up against on that street. Noise is a huge issue, you know, and, 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 and uh, a planning is, tr is, you know, proposing to have residential put on that property, yet the noise and the studies that we've conducted, it just would be, it, would, it, it, it doesn't make sense to put a residential property on a, on a, on a road that is so busy like that. Okay, so those are our really important facts that need to be taken in consideration. The great thing about this is noise barriers can be put up. Like I'm proposing to put a huge fence in the back to cut down that noise for the properties behind on, on Ann Street. And that should highly be taken in consideration because if I was a neighbor, I'd rather be looking at a nice fence than looking at a three-story building if that was the case. And, uh, you know... Uh, something to think about, okay? So we, we plan to put these buffers, these trees, these fences to, to accommodate that and to cut the noise to the back. The, the, when taken all in consideration, the noise that you would hear would be almost zero, okay, when those vacuums run, when they run. There's gonna be more noise from traffic than there will ever be with those vacuum cleaners. And the vacuum cleaners give off a lot more noise than, than the car wash itself because it is contained in a, a concrete structure. Let's go to the next. Okay. The next one is security. The great thing about security and technology is that we have all the resources, the apps. Let's go to the next one. The, um, you know, all the cameras that can basically be monitored by a telephone. So security, I mean, that's going to be important. Obviously, I want the best of security to prevent loitering, to make sure that the machines don't get broken into, uh, or vandalism of any nature, and to see if, you know, if th there's ever going to be, you know, contentions with anything. So I, I'm always going to be monitoring this. So security is not going to play a factor in here because it's within my best interest to take care of things. Next. Lighting. One of the things that has to be done when you do any construction is you have to get a photo, uh, you know, uh, um, studies done, uh, photometric designs uh, to, to accommodate the lands. And uh, neighbors did have concern regarding the lighting. Okay, so this is the type of lamps that we would be considering. These are the, um, these are the pot lights that we, be, we would be using for the soffits. Go ahead. And this is where they actually would be laid out on the property. So there would be, there would be three lamp posts, one, two, three, and these would be the ones under the soffits. Continue. This is how the lighting would actually reflect out to the neighbors. It is negligible. Let's go to the next one. And that's how it actually would look. So the neighbors would not be hindered whatsoever with lighting, okay? Um, these special lights, make sure of this. Okay, next, traffic circulation. We hired engineers to conduct um, an on-site circulation study. It was important that we 
we figured out and we properly knew that there was going to be proper tra uh, traffic circulation on this property. And uh, this company, UEM, uh, conducted this study three years ago, actually. Uh, and uh, they've done all the appropriate designs uh, through auto turn simulation to verify that this land would in fact properly facilitate the circulation of cars within th that minimum lot size that consists. And these are the studies that were conducted. Continue. Okay, so here is all the designs showing how the cars would come in, how it, it would turn in the bay. Okay, in all the bays, it would probably back up, go out. Okay, how it would queue as well. And queuing was a, um, was a question that was brought up by, um, by planning. And um, on a letter that I have uh, dating back to October 3rd of 2000, and 11 on a proposed car wash that was being uh, that is in, that is being considered on Thorlstone Road. I have the paperwork that basically st states that these changes are minor and, uh, and, nece and necessary to pr to promote the proposed building and structure. The requested reduction to the required number of queuing spaces for the manual car wash bay has been supported through a study and is not expected to have any impact on off-site traffic movement. And this was a car wash by Gales Gaspar that was being uh, pro proposed and I don't know if, if or when it is going to come of being. So that was, that was, a, um, that was a traffic study that was done by them. The site plan department actually suggests a uh, low-rise low apartment building, okay? That's what they're suggesting. They're saying I can't do anything with, um, I can't do anything with uh, uh, institutional-wise. Uh, they're proposing that uh, this wouldn't be a good fit, okay? So they're suggesting this low-rise apartment building. And in conducting my studies and research and everything, I would have more variances and adjustments on putting a building on there than I would putting this car wash, okay? And it just doesn't fit. We're talking about a lot that is simply 100 feet by 120 feet. The car wash is all laid out and designed, and yes, there are adjustments being made, but there's, there would be a lot more adjustments. And people living there, because of the noise factor, it just doesn't suit that. Okay. The noise impact on this road uh, is not conducive to resi residential development. It's just so loud over there. Okay, the, the fact that a noise barrier type fence, and I want you to show me the noise barrier type fence here. Okay. I took a picture of a kind of a fence that I, you know, I would highly consider. It's actually a solid fence, okay? This is a fence with boards that run up and down with battens, and I have no problems putting that up, you know, eight, nine feet, whatever, whatever uh, planning would, uh, would accept. And they, they are of the acceptance that should the noise barriers be implemented, that they would be satisfied with, you know, uh, with some of these conditions. So that was actually put into the report, okay? Um, this would help, obviously, in the reduction of noise, and and uh, and this would be actually aesthetically pleasing. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the worship and council members take this in consideration. I spent a lot of time doing uh, research on this. Um, my planner actually has a couple things to say. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor, do you have any questions for Mr. Vodovos? Any questions of council? Okay. What's that? Perry. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Councilor Kerry? No, Mr. Perry, the planner. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mr. Perry, you're going to speak? Yeah, please. <clears throat> Did I know that? 
Good evening, Your uh, Worship and uh, members of City Council. My name is uh, John Perry. I'm a professional planning consultant. I've been retained by Mr. Vadavaz to offer an independent planning opinion on this application. <coughs> um, one thing I should explain that has come recently to my attention is that <coughs> a, uh, uh, as a professional planner, I can offer an independent planning opinion. I have to be careful about becoming an advocate, so all I can really respond to is the planning report and the letter that I wrote to the uh, uh, to Mr. Hurlovich on March 26th. The reason that I have to be careful is that if we were to continue on to an Ontario Municipal Board hearing on this matter, then I have to make sure that I have not become an advocate of this application, only offering an independent planning opinion. <coughs> I did prepare a planning impact assessment, uh, <coughs> and that was... Uh, uh, submitted with the application. Uh, I don't know whether it was included in your uh, package. It was submitted and I'm assuming that it was at some point included. It's a detailed planning ana analysis offering a independent planning opinion. Basically, <coughs> one comment I will make about it is that what you have on McLeod Road at the moment is at one end, uh, just taking a particular area into, into account is, at one point you have a Canadian Tire Store, which is a major anchor. <clears throat> at the other end, you have Walmart, which is another major anchor. Shopping center design planners will tell you that you get two major anchors like that, then in between, be it becomes all the smaller retail stores that uh, are extremely viable because they have the two anchors and the traffic in between. So what you've created on McLeod Road, and I'm sure your planners have told you this, is that you have a shopping center. One anchor being, McLeod, being the Canadian Tire Store, and the other being the Walmart. The uses in between will eventually, if not today, someday will be all become commercial. They are transforming into that, as my client has explained to you and noted, <coughs> hasn't been a lot of residential development in this area, mostly commercial, and that's what's been going on. <clears throat> the letter that I wrote to Mr. Hulovich was <clears throat> intended simply to highlight some of the items in his report that I said, you know, maybe this should be a little clearer. And that's one of the things that you want to do when you write a planning report to council is it should be good reporting. That is, be accurate about what you're saying. And I have made a number of notes, just I want to just refer to a couple of them. First of all, <coughs> it's just that this is an intrusion of a commercial use into the middle of a residentially designated area. Um, that's fair enough if you just look at the residential designation, but if you look at the land uses in the area, you find that there are very few residential uses, most of them are commercial. Directly across the street is a plaza, next to that's Kojiko. Then you have the institutional use of the church. Then you have four single family homes that have been there for quite some time. The other uses that are in the area, again, are all their commercial uses that have been developed recently. And that tells you that this is changing from a residential area into a commercial area, which all makes sense because of the two commercial anchors that you have at each end as a shopping center. The next point <clears throat> that I'd like to talk to you about is it notes in the report that the lands are insufficiently sized to accommodate use as reflected in the number of departures necessary to the city's zoning standards. <clears throat> um, as a land use planner, my approach has always been if something represents good land use planning, I don't care what documents you have to amend, you amend all of them until you get to good land use planning. I don't care if you have to do 100 variances or if you have to amend the official plan and zoning bill. It, the first task of a planner is to say what represents good land use planning here, not how many documents you have to amend. So in this sense, <coughs> this use fits in well with the context of what's going on on McLeod Road. So in that sense, I don't really understand why it's so important to wonder about what the variances are 
as opposed to what represents good land use planning. The final point that I'd like to make is that <clears throat> the report recommends that it should be used for residential purposes. Uh, this doesn't really make a lot of sense to me because of the noise from McLeod Road. The, the building you're talking about that would have to be there as an apartment building or whatever you want would have to be soundproof. You wouldn't be able to open up a patio door. You wouldn't be able to open up a window uh, unless you're going to be disturbed by the traffic. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to put residential in that position. Now, <clears throat> Walmart's not bothered by noise. Canadian Tire is not bothered by noise. The shopping center across the street's not bothered by noise. Those are the uses that you look at when you're talking about a noise situation and you want to put a land use in there that fits appropriately. The car wash is not bothered by noise. So <clears throat> in that sense, the best land use that I can think of is really the car wash. There are things that it has to be done through the site plan process to make sure that it technically fits, but we think we can do that. Anyway, as I said at the outset, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm sort of handcuffed because I have, can only speak with, to, with regard to my planning report and the letter that I wrote, and those are my comments. I'd be pleased to answer any questions uh, the council may have. Thank you, any questions of Mr. Perry from council? Okay, no, it uh, looks like we're good. No questions right now. Thank you very much for that. All right, Council, you've heard the presentation. The public meeting with respect to the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Looking for a motion or direction from Council. Councilor Iannone? Move staff's recommendation. Okay. Moved by Councillor Inoni, seconded by Councillor Crater. Do we have any uh, comments or questions of Council? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, opposed? Okay, so that's the approved, the Council report has been approved, so the proposal is not allowed. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey, Mr. Clerk, could you please introduce the next item on the agenda? Your Worship, a public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city zoning bylaw to uh, permit a four story, 32 unit apartment dwelling and block townhouse project with 19 dwelling units at uh, basically the property at the corner of Mewburn Road and Mountain Road. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Friday, February 27th, 2017 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board shall leave their name on the sign in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And I'll ask Mr. Herlovich, our Director of Planning, to explain the purpose and the, re and the reason for the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Thank you, Your Worship. The, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the property in question is uh, located at the southeast corner of uh, Mountain Road and uh, Mewburn Road. So <coughs> it involves actually three parcels of land. So the parcel containing a motel, the back of a residential property, and then another residential property that fronts onto um, McLeod, or onto Mountain Road, rather. Um, the, uh, you can see there are adjacent uh, single family houses to the east. There are condominium townhouses to the, um, to the south. There are some vacant uh, residential commercial lands to the west and to the north are some city owned lands, part of the former uh, landfill site. Um, um, so again, this is basically pointing out that the, the uh, lands that I've just the, uh, described uh, using just the, uh, the lotting pattern, but basically uh, the site is 1.12 hectares in size. So the proposal is to uh, establish um, an apartment building right at the corner of Mewburn and Mountain Road, and then a number of townhouse blocks 
that would be abutting the single family houses to the north and the single family houses to the uh, east. Uh, there's a driveway then that would come uh, south off Mountain Road and service the site internally. The uh, apartment building has an underground parking structure. The layout of that parking structure is shown here on the left. The ramp to that parking structure there as well as surface parking. The townhouse condominiums would actually have uh, their own uh, garages and uh, driveways. The, uh, they are seeking a number of variations from the standard uh, zoning, so where the zoning requires somewhere between 200 square meters per unit for the apartments and 250 square meters per unit for the townhouses. They're seeking an overall average of 215 square meters uh, per unit across the entire site. Um, they do want to build a four-story building, so they're seeking a height of 16.2 uh, meters. That's just slightly under uh, 50 feet. The, uh, they are seeking some side yard setbacks of 1.5 meters. Um, it's largely here. I'm not sure what that might point in there. Oh, that's half the building height is what they're seeking there, and the 1.5 meters here. The maximum building height for the townhouses would be 10 meters, so it's the same as uh, the adjacent single family residential zone. The, uh, um, so those are the uh, general layout of the property and the uh, proposal. So in essence, three parcels, as I've mentioned, almost three acres of land, four-story apartment building at the corner for 32 units. Uh, those would be condominium units and then the 19 unit townhouse block development. The lands are currently zoned development holding. Uh, they're seeking an R4 zone. Uh, and the R4 zone permits both uh, apartment dwellings and townhouse dwellings. And I've outlined the, uh, the variations that they're looking to those standards. Uh, there was a neighborhood uh, meeting in February. Uh, 22 residents did come out. Uh, they had primary, their primary concerns were about the servicing and storm drainage. There had been some uh, uh, basement flooding in this uh, general vicinity in the past. They were concerned that this would not exacerbate that uh, situation. They also had uh, concerns that, um, that there be pre-construction uh, surveying done so that if there was any damage, um, the damage could be repaired. They had questions about uh, fencing and privacy, the use of cedar trees, uh, whether those would be retained. Um, one resident said he would prefer the three stories instead of a four-story uh, building. Um, the, the, uh, the applicant uh, basically outlined that, that they would need to be doing the servicing study, although the region does say there's sufficient capacity in the pumping station um, next to uh, at Mewburn Road and Mountain. Um, the uh, provincial policy statements, as we've said many times, encourages intensification. They're encouraging efficient use of urban lands. Uh, the site itself is just to the uh, right-hand side. There's a, a wooden fence, and that's where the, uh, the motel is now. It, um, and the lands are basically classified as uh, underutilized or underperforming in terms of their uh, residential opportunities. The lands are designated residential. The official plan uh, provides for uh, a mix of townhouses and apartment buildings uh, with frontage on a collector uh, road. Uh, Mountain Road is actually an arterial road, so a higher order road. Mewburn Road is a collector road. Uh, the apartment building is set back um, from the uh, townhouses and the um, uh, single family. We can just split back here again. So basically, um, the single family that are located here the apartment building is well set back, and we have actually these uh, townhouses uh, uses proposed as an intervening use. So the uh, developer has proposed, uh, I, I'm sorry, I've been wrong. Um, a sympathetic um, arrangement of those uses. The apartment building I mentioned has a parking garage. Um, the uh, roads can support uh, the uh, the um, traffic that would be generated and there are services to support the development. The requested zoning, I mentioned, is an R4 zone. The density is acceptable. Uh, again, it is a little bit higher than what we would normally have. So rather than 250 and 200, they've, aver they've been exactly averaged out. They've 
reduce that down to 215 square meters per unit. Um, they are seeking oops, that uh, additional height to accommodate the uh, fourth floor of the apartment building. Uh, the townhouses, as I mentioned, would have the same height as the adjacent residential zoning. Um, the, uh, the reduced pri privacy yard, there's a uh, six meter privacy yard. I'll just go back for a second. Um, and that might not have been clear. I didn't, I didn't speak to that as I went through. So between this uh, row of townhouses and this row of townhouses, they would have a six meter uh, yard where normally we require seven and a half. Uh, they do provide it here. Uh, this is a lesser yard as well there. So again, these are back-to-back -back interior units. This is backing onto the side yard of the uh, existing dwelling. Um, so we are, um, you know, uh, con we have concluded rather that the uh, scale of the housing is compatible with the intent of the residential designation, that the policies do support the multi multiple unit dwellings. The, uh, uh, there is an appropriate transition between the height of the apartment building and the adjacent low density and low uh, height um, housing adjacent to it. The, the deviations from the standard R4 regulations are acceptable uh, as part of the compact urban form of development. There is sufficient servicing and transportation infrastructure to support this development. And therefore, we are recommending that Council approve the zoning bylaw for the R4 zone for residential low density and group multiple dwellings for the four story uh, 32 unit apartment building and the 19 block townhouse units, uh, subject to the regulations outlined in this report. Thank you, Mr. Rilovich. Uh, any could members I just of interject? I know yes? the proponent is here and he has his presentation on a stick. Um, I don't know whether it's going to be possible to install that today or not, but um, anyway. No. Anyway. So I just thought I'd bring that up. Um, normally we do get them in, in advance, but uh, that wasn't the situation here. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Hulovich. Any questions of council for Mr. Hulovich? Okay, seeing none. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing any referral that it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheet will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes? Yes, you can step forward just to the microphone here. You just state your name and your address, please. Your Worship, members of council, my name is Ann Cruz and I live on Mewburn Road. I'm uh, part of a group from the uh, Condominium Corporation at 2684 Mewburn. And we realize we can't stop progress, but we really want to voice our concern and disapproval for the four-story apartment building. The townhouses are going to be two-story. That's fine. Our condominium corporation are all uh, bungalows. So this four-story apartment building is going to stick out like a sore thumb. It's going to be much higher than any of the buildings in the area. Um, over on Olden, the houses are two-story. Uh, there are also, also two relatively new condo corporation apartment buildings uh, in the city of Niagara Falls. One's near Queen's Coach on Portage Road and the other one is at the end of Pettit Street. Both of them are only three story. They look very nice, they blend in with the properties around them and this is our main concern. Um, we would really like to see it a three story apartment building. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Cruz, uh, we have anyone else other than the applicant? Can you state your name and your address please? Yes, uh, hello council, my name is David Mason. Uh, my family and I reside at 2673 Olden Avenue. So we kind of back on to this area a little bit. Uh, our concerns are the same as what my, my neighbor just talked about. We uh, are concerned about the height, the zoning amendment for the height of this building. It doesn't fit in with the character of our neighborhood. 
We actually love our neighborhood. We've been there for over 25 years. When we bought our house, the house behind us where my, my uh, fellow neighbor just uh, talked about lives now, it was a, a base piece of land with one home on it. And we inquired to the city as to zoning changes. Would there be an apartment building in my backyard? We were told, no, that can't happen. Doesn't fit in with the character of the neighborhood. It'd be very difficult to change that zoning amendment. And now we have one in front of us now. So we're opposed to that. We have concerns regarding flooding and other things as well. But our main concern is the, uh, is the two, sorry, is a four-story building. It doesn't fit in with the character of our neighborhood. And my concern looking forward is, if you allow this change, what's going to happen to the land that's between Mewburn and the QEW? It's currently vacant land. Are we going to wind up having an amendment down the road where there's winds up with a 32-story condo building uh, there as well? So my concern is going forward. I don't, like, I don't like the idea of us changing it, for one, because then you're going to be forced to change it for others down the road. So that's why we're opposed to having this uh, zoning amendment changed to allow the building of this four-story building. We also had concerns, as I mentioned to council, I did send uh, an email to council before regarding this. Uh, we're concerned with the flooding because our area does have a high flooding issue. We've actually fought for, for many, many years to finally get a sump pump installed in our house because we had flooding issues. We want to see uh, changes with that. And we're concerned as well with the Robinson Road. Uh, the, I'm sure when they come up with their amendment, there's a street here that heads out to it's on the right-hand side of that picture that's up now. It heads out onto uh, Mountain Road. We're concerned that that exit to there is now going to create more traffic on my street, which is Olden Avenue, also exit within one house width uh, to the left of that picture, right? So we're concerned about traffic coming out that way as well. So maybe a consideration to, to look forward to, uh, sorry, for council to look forward at, is if we're going to allow this and looking at maybe traffic study around that, is it maybe in the best interest to close off the Olden Road access to Mountain, to Mountain Road? Kind of helps reduce traffic in my area to begin with. But it would also create less of a traffic or vehicle, what I'm concerned about is vehicle incidents, uh, with vehicles leave, trying to leave that Robinson Lane area and trying to leave Olden Avenue at the same time. So that's something I would look, like you guys to consider as well. Uh, and sorry, I talked, I'm just making sure I'm covering all the things that we talked about. So we're concerned about the flooding, we're concerned about the height of the building. Uh, and one other thing, if I could ask, in the past, when we had the development behind us done, during that whole process, back then we were a ward system and we're now a city at large system, but it would be nice if we could have a council member at the open houses so we could have someone to speak with at that particular time. Because when I uh, relayed my concerns via email through to the council, I kind of got the impression I wasn't supposed to do that. So I just, I would prefer to have that voice at the council meeting. I know there was, you know, there was some short uh, notice, I guess, and a couple of councilors expressed that they would have been, uh, like to have come, but, you know, it couldn't happen. But maybe there's something that council can consider down the road. When you know these open houses are gonna happen, maybe we can send a, a councilor there as well. Councilor? Yeah, just through to Mr. Mason, you can contact any of us at any time. That's never overstepping. Yeah, no, and I, and I have okay. before. I mean, I've even spoken with Dean about that land that's going to change now, about the grass getting very high. <laughs> so I, but, but, you know, I just wanted to express that. It would be really nice to have a voice there at that meeting that we can talk to. I mean, we see a lot of you open around all the time, but at that particular time, it would have been nice to have someone there to uh, represent us. Councillor Crater? I was, I was just going to let you know that our staff does send us out, and they're called neighborhood meetings, mm -hmm. and they faithfully send us a notice, and then the councils can councils can decide when many are, have commitments. It's not like, those meetings aren't regularly scheduled, right. whatever they decide to have. And, you know, and to the council's credit, at one time they didn't have neighborhood meetings. No, you, no, that's one right. One time it just came right to the city council. So it was this council uh, many, many years ago that made a decision to try to have neighborhood meetings so you get a chance to meet the developer and that's before good you show up at city council. I've attended a, a few of them myself, but again, it's hard because they're scheduled, scheduled at random. It's not every councilor can, can fit their schedule to go. So I understand. It isn't, it isn't that they don't want to. 
And I know I've gone to a few. I know some of the other counselors as well. Your point's well taken, though. I understand that. Just before you sit down, yep. oh, is it appropriate yep. to ask a couple questions? Yep, if, if a question of uh, yeah, Mr. Did. Mason, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the um, the three-story, did you have any discussions with the developers about at the neighborhood meeting? At the neighborhood it? meeting, we had talked about it. Yeah. Uh, most of the conversations kept revolving around all the flooding issues. Flooding. It was brought up, but it didn't, it didn't really go anywhere at the meeting. Most of the, uh, because we only had like an hour, right? So and there were quite a few people, quite a amount of few, uh, sorry, quite a few people there, and it took a while. And majority of the conversation was around flooding and and noise and things during construction. So it was tabled, but it wasn't really uh, able to be discussed. What's, what's the with, solution with to the flooding problem that you have? Uh, well, myself, I, uh, you know, we had flooding up on our street on Olden Avenue for years. We went, I mean, we were, not too long after we bought the house, we got flooded out. But are they, uh, and does the development have a solution to, to have it? My understanding is that they have, the they way know. they talked about, and I don't want to speak for them, but the way they talked about the drainage, it was they have to follow rules as far as whatever water comes off the land now can only be that same amount of land water sorry, that leaves the land that way. So they talked about some storm sewer systems and so forth internally, but I don't want to... I don't want to speak. We'll exactly save that for, for the, the, the yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'll just close with just asking. So if it was a three story, then everything you could live with everything. Is that what you three story? Said? I could live with more. Okay. Yes. All right. Because like I said, you know, I'm looking at this development, but also I'm trying to think down the road. So maybe right? the developer will have some good news. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Thank you very much. Uh, and the last thing I just wanted yes, to mention, first. sorry, yeah. was we, uh, the other day when you had your uh, state of the city address and you talked about the my neighborhood. I like that idea, and that's why we love, you know, we love our neighborhood. It's a great neighborhood. I mean, that's what all these people have moved in for. So, thank you very much right. for your time. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mason. You said this to <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any? Uh, do we have anyone else? Yeah, by all means, come up to the microphone, please. You can just state your name and your address, please. Yes, uh, my name is Daphne Johnson, and I'm I'm number 17. We are number 17 at 2684 Mewburn Road. Um, your Worship, Mayor. Uh, it, Obviously, we're here because of the zoning, and we do have a real problem with the four-story apartment complex. And um, actually, our condo complex is directly south of the proposed development, right at the at the very property line. And we, in our condos, are and homes are all one stories, and we respectfully asked to really, I mean, to approve a two-story. I don't even know why we're talking three-story, never mind four-story, because they're all two-story. Even their um, proposed development of townhouses are two stories. So we would really, really like to see them even stay lower because, I mean, we, we're in this special complex. And it was, a, we did approach the um, developer regarding three stories. And as usual, as we all know here, I mean, this part of life, it's all about money. So, and we're also concerned about the underground parking and the additional parking that's gonna happen with this apartment complex on Mewburn, because we have five of our, our uh, people, our neighbors that are right on there, and that's gonna be unbelievable. So thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone else other than the applicant that would like to speak? Yeah, by all means, you can come forward, yeah. Uh, yeah. Bob Wilkinson, uh, I live in Unit 7 at 2684 Mewburn. And I'm just a, a, an interested resident. Um, and, and when this all started, um, I thought, well, okay, it's gonna happen. And but I have spent a lot of time thinking about this and and it was Saturday, I guess, I, I drove from back from St. Catharines and I came over the highway uh, on, on Mountain Road to get to Mewburn. And it struck me at that point that when you drive, and I, and I would like anybody to do this and tell me that a four-story apartment building is going to fit in to that landscape. There is nothing with the eye can see that isn't at the most two stories. And, and I think, uh, and I applaud the developer, I applaud the planning department and all these people, but I think one of the people, one of the, that we need to move forward, but at the same time, we have to recognize the people that have already invested their money 
in the property that's already there. And that's what, that's what this is all about, is that we're really talking about trying to protect our, the, our, our property, to protect our investment. And I don't know whether a four-story, a three-story, or a two-story will have a great deal of effect, but when you look at it, it doesn't look right. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next up. Your Worship. Council. My name is Rick Andrews. I live at 2664 Olden Avenue. Um, I'm only going to speak on one matter, and that's the, the size of the apartment building, four stories versus two or three stories. Uh, I think this council remembers the controversy that took place several years ago with regards to a sign on just the opposite side of the road here that was about three stories high and was deemed unfit because of the escarpment and the appearance of the neighborhood. And that sign was an eyesore. It was taken down. This apartment building will be just the same sort of eyesore. Now, again, we have to realize that the neighborhood is one and two story or side split homes. So a four story home in that neighborhood will be something different than what is there uh, in, the, in the entire neighborhood, all the way down to um, Dorchester. So what I'm thinking is what other people are saying, the project has to go ahead. It's, it, it, what is there should not be there right now. But maybe we should reconsider the idea of four stories. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Do we have anyone else that would like to speak other than the applicant with some any new ideas or new concepts we haven't already heard? Yes, your uh, your uh, mayor, uh, Ken Cruz, Unit Two on uh, 2684 Mewburn Road. Uh, in 2006, the pumping station that is on the corner uh, failed to do whatever. All our basements along Mewburn Road were flooded. When we spoke to the uh, gentlemen that are proposing this site, they said that has been addressed, and this pumping station will handle this new development. My concern is, if it didn't handle what's already there, how's it gonna handle this with no new adjustments? And in uh, the next point I want to make, the Bruce Trail is right there. You, uh, the city put up a nice walkway across the QEW, which is just adjacent to this property. The Bruce Trail is very popular. It's, uh, it's world renowned. Now you're gonna have this four story building sitting there. I don't think it fits into the landscape. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Holman, can we just get confirmation on the, the pumping station and its uh, uh, health and its capacity? Uh, Mr. Mayor, in the staff report, you'll see comments from both regional and uh, city staff that the pumping station has adequate dry weather capacity to handle uh, these flows. So uh, there, there have been some upgrades to that station. I don't remember if it's pre or post 2006. Um, but um, you know, uh, we'll be asking the developer to provide us with a design brief that uh, confirms what the, uh, uh, the actual pumping capacity is. Okay, thank you. you. Yes, uh, Councilor Peter Ames. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. And, and just through you to uh, Mr. Holman, did I hear Mr. Holman correctly say that it has adequate, adequate dry weather capacity? That's correct. So that means that when there's no rain, it works fine. But when it rains, it's not guaranteed. Because it means that it's for dry weather? No, as I've reported in the past, we allocate capacity based on dry weather flows. So in the calculation, the, the regional staff, our city staff would look at what flows would have come out of the previous developed site and look at the net impact and net increase. All right, and, and so the pumping station has a certain capacity. Uh, during wet weather events, uh, depending on the duration, the frequency, intensity of the storm, the existing uh, conditions, uh, there may be some impacts. And some of the residents have been, uh, uh, on, especially on Olden Avenue, have been impacted by wet weather flows. That's largely a result of weeping tile connections, downspout connections, 
and the quality of effluent that's in that particular area. This development would drain into the Newburn Road pumping station, which is right on the corner of, uh, uh, of that intersection. And it's effluent during dry weather flows, dry weather conditions, would be pumped up uh, a long mountain road uh, to the next road up. I believe it's... Uh, St. Paul? Or no. Wood, Woodview? Woodgate, Woodview. All right, so the, the, the uh, flows from this subdivision or from this development would not be discharged into the pipe right across from the residence on Olden Avenue. All right, so we still have a problem on Olden Avenue, and we've tried to mitigate those issues through our RAP program and through downspot disconnection. Uh, and, we'll, and you'll see when we have back with our PCP plan, we'll have a, a more aggressive strategy. But unless we, uh, you know, unless we designed our sewer system to every weather condition, there would be uh, no further development in the city. Awesome. Yeah. Your Worship, I'm not sure about uh, I'm not sure about other people, but um, and I can appreciate what Mr. Holman's saying. It doesn't give me a great deal of comfort to know that we're uh, that we're okay for dry weather systems. Um, I I can understand that the region would own the pumping station. Just a question through you to Mr. Holman: Would the region dictate the capacity of that pumping station, or would it be something that the city has involvement? In? Mr. Holman, well. <coughs> Uh, science dictates the, the capacity of the station. It's designed to handle uh, development uh, in that area, including the vacant land that uh, that sits uh, to the south of it, which is undeveloped at the moment. So, you know, the question is, how much capacity do you reserve? And do you reserve it for uh, storm events, or do you design it uh, using the best practices across the province, which is this dry weather flow calculation. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I don't know how to uh, give you any other assurance. Uh, can I say that uh, when it rains, uh, it's going to overflow? Probably not. But um, you know, in, in that situation where the pump station failed, I don't know uh, if it was a malfunction of the equipment, a backup power. Um, I, I couldn't give you the specifics on that. But we'll have those answers before we approve uh, any site plan because we'll have uh, um, a doc the document be prepared by a professional engineer and approved by all the approval agencies, including the region of Niagara that owns that facility. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Cario? <laughs> See, on that, I, I appreciate Mr. Holman's comments as well, but I, I feel the same way that Councillor Peter Angelo does and some of the neighbors may do. If I listen carefully to what Mr. Holman was saying, then I agree with the neighbors that without that development there, if it rains for six days, I don't flood my basement. If it rains for seven days, maybe I do. But with the new development there, maybe my basement floods after two days of rain. So that, not knowing what the thing is designed for, it makes it difficult for us to make an assessment on their concern on that one, I guess. Okay, thank you, thank you. Any other counselors have questions? Okay, seeing none, council now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Hello, uh, Lee White, 116 Jarvis Street in Fort Erie, representing the applicant. If you could put the uh, sketch of the property up, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thank you. This is the design concept that we've uh, got right in now, and it's been described in detail. I'll just go over it very briefly. With the uh, existing apartment building here, 32 units on four floors and 30 parking spaces beneath that, six blocks of townhomes, a total of 19 units here. Um, on the east end over here at the entrance onto uh, Mountain Road, uh, we did a, did a traffic study for the project and it was recommended that that be a right in, right out only, so that if you are coming along the development here, you can only turn right onto Mountain Road. 
you cannot turn left into it. You can only, if you're traveling eastbound here, can you pull into the site. So that if you live here and you want to go to the QEW, you come out this way along this road to Mewburn, go around the circle and head out to QEW that way. So that'll limit uh, the amount of traffic on Mewburn Road, or sorry, on Mountain Road at that, at that intersection that is closest to Alden right there. Um, so we have proposed a, uh, a four-story building. Uh, it has been designed in such a manner that it has an appearance of three stories. The fourth story has sort of shingling going down the side of it um, that I'll describe just uh, in a little bit. And also the, the, the roof is the minimum slope necessary to keep the, keep the height to a minimum as well overall. Uh, the architect has taken a look at the visual impact of this building here to the single family residence right here from a second story window would not be able to see this because this, the, all they would see would be this town home unit right here. So even to the peak of the roof from a second story window, that would not be visible. We are proposing a privacy fence uh, around the entire east side and along the south side and around these properties right here so that there would be a privacy fence. Uh, was an issue that we have discussed with the neighbors to uh, would, uh, accept their input into the design of that. Uh, and uh, I'll discuss later as well, but there's even the, the three meter buffer along the entire side here, the east side and the south side, that would be available for landscaping. We will do a landscape plan as part of the, as part of the design and we'll uh, consult the neighbors on that. It's actually some existing cedar trees right in this area right in here that the uh, neighbors to the south have expressed a desire to keep. They do encroach a little bit onto our property, but we have agreed that we would uh, have the fence sort of jog in a little bit, still maintain on that three meter, and then just be able to keep them. That wouldn't be an issue. So the townhome units themselves um, have been designed by our architect and uh, are aesthetically very pleasing, not, cart not boxes by any means. They have good finishes, columns in the front, um, not rectangular, do have corners knocked off them as well. You can see they are architecturally quite pleasing. As well on the, uh, the apartment building itself, it's a mansard, mansard roof, sort of comes down the side on the fourth floor. I don't know if you will be able to see this, but you've got the first, second, and third floor. The fourth story windows have got sort of shingling on the side. It has an appearance of being the roof on the fourth floor. And then it's relatively flat across the top with a minimum minimum peak slope along the, uh, along the roof just to keep the height to 6.2 meters. The uh, design criteria that we used in, uh, in coming up uh, with this proposal, uh, we'd be removing a dated motel that's used uh, for long-term rentals right now. Uh, not by any means for tourists. See that as being desirable, increasing the tax base for the city with upscale residential units in a desirable neighborhood. Uh, opportunity for aging in place residency. There's currently not much opportunity for in the North End right now for that. Um, mixed residential development providing housing opportunities, uh, both the town homes and these uh, apartment style units. It uh, achieves residential in intensification, which is good planning and consistent with the provincial policy statement and the city's official plan. And uh, as was previously mentioned, it provides a transition of densities to keep the highest density being the apartment building furthest away from all of the existing residences. You know, we can't go any further to maintain setbacks here. We've got over 17 meters, over like oh, well over 50 feet on this side here and uh, we're as far as away as we can get from here and the residences over on this side as well. And uh, to quote staff, we've got substantial buffers to the existing residences. How did we get to this point right here? By no means did we just throw something together and throw it in front of everybody and make application. We had our initial pre-consultation meeting in August of 2015, at which time we got some feedback from, from staff, uh, including expect some pushback from the neighbors. Um, based on some historic uh, proposals and suggested that we meet with the neighbors as well uh, to discuss uh, any opposition that they may have. Um, so we went back to the drawing board, came up with a revised concept plan to incorporate some of the recommendations from staff, the region, and the MPCA, 
and uh, refined the concept plan, had a second pre-consultation in June of 2016. Again, getting some additional feedback. When we had uh, made our original proposal, we had proposed to rezone the westerly portion of the property where the apartment building is to R5, uh, which would allow for higher, uh, higher apartment buildings, and R4 for the balance of it where the townhomes were. Um, in order to provide some assurance to the neighbors that uh, our proposal truly was for a four-story building, and in consultation with the staff, um, decided rather than proposing R5 on the west end and the balance R4, we do R, a site-specific R4 for the entire site and set a maximum height so that it could only be four stories and not be any higher on the westerly end of the parcel. That's sort of the rationale on how we got here and that sort of necessitated that height variance was uh, by allowing that to be the maximum in the R4, uh, R4 district. So once we got a, a plan that we had a good sense of comfort with, we uh, knocked on doors, every single one of the adjacent property owners had some flyers with us, spoke with some people, left some information for some other people uh, in advance of the, the normal neighborhood meeting. Did that in October of 2016 after that last pre-consultation. And then the neighborhood meeting was held last month in February. And then even as recently as uh, last Friday, met with some of the neighbors at their house um, at the condo association to the south. The representative also from his center single family residence right there was also there and uh, some, some concerns were voiced as well, primarily being the height of that apartment building. That seemed to be the, the primary issue, although there were several points of agreement that we did have and uh, some things that we agreed uh, to work with them in the future as well. There is currently a, a short bit of an op uh, open ditch right here in the south end of the property, right in there, um, that we agreed that we would uh, close in uh, as part of the design and just have that uh, closed pipe system, that there would be no blasting as part of the construction, um, uh, that we would conduct pre-construction surveys of all of the existing homes and the people who are willing to allow us to do that, take pictures, walk around with them just to make sure and document any potential damage down the road, whether or not it was attributable to the construction on the site, at least be able to document it and have that done. Um, also agreed that they did want those cedar trees on the on the south side maintained. They do encroach onto the property, but you know, just will jog around them with the privacy fence. Uh, also agreed to work with the neighbors uh, during the development of the landscape plan. Uh, during the neighborhood meeting, there was uh, some interesting concepts that come up. One of the individuals who lived on old and over here, he said, you know, I've got a pool in my backyard. I got some young kids. How do I know somebody's not gonna come screaming around this corner and crash through my fence into my backyard? We'll put a great big rock right here as part of the landscape plan. Great. <laughs> Problem addressed. Those are the types of simple things that we can address by sitting down, and we'll get them involved in the landscape plan development. So it's this isn't the detailing of the landscaping. We'll develop that in consultation with the neighbors. I've made that promise to them. So we'll have whatever they're looking for uh, in this strip that we've got along the edge here, as well as uh, interior. There are some existing trees in there. Most of it's mowed lawn but there's some relatively large existing trees that'll have to come down. So we'll work with them and a licensed landscape architect to put that plan together uh, as part of the plan submittal. And also agreed to follow up meetings with the neighbors. So we'll be attending their condo association annual general meeting coming up uh, later on in, in April. And uh, they also suggested that they would like to see some speed bumps uh, installed and uh, that wouldn't be a problem for us either. So well, there was definitely quite a few points that, uh, that were brought up that uh, we agreed we could work with them on, and we'll continue to do so. Um, in our opinion, you know, the project constitutes good planning as well as that of staff. We're looking at an $18 million new assessment for the city, and uh, as well as getting rid of that old hotel, uh, achieving residential intensification consistent with the policy statement, provincial policy statement and the official plan, uh, the subject lands are designated as residential in the city's official plan. And then I'll take three quotes from the staff report. Uh, residential lands with frontage on collector roads can be developed with apartments with building heights up to four stories and a maximum density of 75 units per hectare. Uburn Road is a collector and Mountain Road is classified as a higher order arterial road. So 
maximum de uh, density potential 75 units per hectare. The development contains a mix of townhouses and apartment buildings and has a density of 45 units per hectare, quite below what the maximum development potential of this property is in accordance with the city, city's official plan. This density is well below the maximum permitted density for a development with frontage on a collector road and the types of units are expected on a property of this at this location. The apartment building, again, this is staff's report's recommendation. The apartment building is proposed to be set back a significant distance from adjacent low density housing, over 17 meters from the south lot line and 120 meters to the easterly lot line. These setbacks along with intervening townhouses will mitigate any perceived impacts of the height of the apartment building and provide a graduation of building heights and densities. That's the reason we designed it the way we did. You know, with a road, single loaded road all the way around the outside just to maximize the distance from those existing houses to the extent that we could. And there are uh, several other higher density residential uses north of uh, Thorold Stone Road, many of which you're familiar with, uh, between five to nine stories in height. And again, all of these are achieving provincial policy of intensification of residential development within existing urban areas. And basically at this point, respectfully request that council give consideration to staff's recommendation and approve the reason. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. White. We've got questions from council. I've got Councilor Morocco and then Strange. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, sir, for your presentation. Greatly appreciate it. And it's uh, great to know that you try to work with the uh, residents too. Um, I'm somewhat uh, a little confused. You said that your four story somewhat looks like a three story. So it's either a four story or it's a three story. Mm -hmm. It's a four. It's a four story. It's definitely a four story. It is. Um, yeah, man. But it's got a flat roof and it, it keeps the height to a minimum. Um, I think that you know uh, what I'm hearing from the residents is that they're they're willing to compromise, and the only problem that they have is this four story building. Is there any uh, possibility that uh, the developer or yourselves would look at a two story or three story, the maximum? Is that something that would be of negotiating? Each uh, one of the stories has got eight units on it and at an approximate value of $250,000 each, it's $2 million of assessment and value with I know, relatively I, little. I appreciate the fact that, you know, we talk about uh, the money. For, for me, yeah, it's great that the, they want to bring more money in the coffers. I think that it's more important what the residents want. That's what I was elected to do is to make sure that we make the decision based on the people that put us here. So I, I appreciate the dollars, but when it comes down that people are, are here, to tell us that that's not what they want. I'm here to try and negotiate and kind of come to some type of a deal that works for everyone. Um, so when it comes down to it, I'm sorry that I'm not all about the money mm -hmm. that's going to be made from this condo or four built four room, four story apartment. Um, and and with all due respect, I will speak to myself. I'm sure my fellow counselors will speak for themselves on that. But uh, again, my question is. Uh, would you look or consider doing a three story? Because at the point right, it is right now, and based on uh, not knowing the uh, capacity of the sewer that's able to, to hold this new development, I, I really have a huge issue with that. I know that we'll have to address the sewer, and if the sewer uh, system and our staff says that it's something that we can fix and can accommodate, I'd really like to see this become a three story um, and, and not a four story, because I think that would work pretty much all the residents here. And then I would be able to support it. As the way it stands now, I would definitely not look at supporting this plan, so. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, Councilor Strange. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, I was just gonna ask the same question for some kind of compromise. Obviously, the residents here, uh, the two issues are, is obviously the flooding and then the, uh, how high it is. And he says the four story looks like a three story. So if you made a three story, it looked like a two story. So it'd be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, that was good. All right, Councillor uh, Peter Angelo. I just ask you if you if you don't mind, but we have to maintain decorum here. Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I would echo the comments of the previous councillors on the height. Uh, I just have a couple questions through you to Mr. White. Mr. White, uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, 
I just want to let you know I really appreciate the fact that you stated to council that you're going to include all the neighbors in the site plan approval process. I think it's very important that they stay with you and that they have input and that you take their input to heart. A um, couple questions that I have. You talked about building a fence and the fence would go on the south side of your property and on the east side. And I, I'm just wondering, I have two questions. I mean, um, what would that privacy fence look like to you and who would have ownership of it? Because my understanding is that it would be along a roadway. So in 10 years time, I guess I'm looking down the road and thinking to myself, if perhaps it needs maintenance, who's responsible for it at that point? Yep, that uh, did come up at our conversation last Friday. It would be on our property, nice side facing facing the neighbors. And so it would be our property, our responsibility. Uh, we've got a three meter buffer, so it would be as close to the property line as we can to maintain a little bit of room for shrubs, trees, and, and even grass to grow on that strip. Um, so it would be close to the property line on our side, except where it jogs to go around those existing cedars on the south side and uh, would go all along the east, the south, as well as around the properties to the north. So that's a pretty long fence. Yep. Um, and that would be the ownership of the condominium that's going on the corner? Is that how it would work? So yeah, yeah. who would maintain that fence is my question. Like 10 years down the road, if it needs maintenance, who would be responsible for that? Because I understand that you're going to take ownership in building it. But then who would maintain ownership of it once it was built? The condo associations that would be created as a part of the new development. And the so condo associations would consist of whoever purchases the apartments only, or would it be the townhouse? No, nope, there would there well? yeah, technically there'd be two condo associations. One uh, sort of for the common element of the road going all the way around, that would be maintained by all of the parties, the town homeowners as well as the uh, apartment building owners. They would, uh, the apartment building owners would also have a second condo association in order for the specific maintenance, including internal common areas within that building and the underground parking as well. So there's just a little bit of additional responsibility, but collectively for the common element, the entire road would be held in basically five shares, one for the apartment building and four for, for being held between the, uh, the town the homes. Townhouse. Okay. Yeah. My other question was in regards to um, the frontages that the apartments would have on both uh, Mountain Road and Mewburn Road. Could you just let me know, because it's really hard to read. It's a very small uh, diagram that, that, that we get. What would be your frontage on Mountain Road and what would be your frontage on Mewburn Road? Okay, frontage on Mountain, we sort of split uh, the far easterly portion where the block six and that one entrance is, that's uh, just shy of, uh, th it's about 30.5 meters. And on Mewburn? Um, on Mewburn, I believe it's uh, just over 75 meters. 75 meters. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, and then we've also got the sort of the westerly portion on Mountain, which makes a total of about uh, over 90 meters, I believe, on uh, Mountain Road. Okay, and I guess the reason that I'm asking is because you, you very well articulated the fact that you know, you're know you on a collector road, um, and so therefore you should be given the privilege of building 75 uh, units per hectare. But the way I look at it, I mean, as I look at the building, I mean, you only have a small portion of frontage on Mountain Road. Your main frontage is on Mewburn Road, and your main entrance is on Mewburn Road. I mean, even the even the diagram that you passed around to us shows the frontage of the building being on Mewburn Road. So would it not be more correct to, I guess, establish the units per hectare on Mewburn Road as opposed to on Mountain Road? Um, technically the frontage, there is less frontage on Mewburn than there is totally along totally, Mountain. Totally, right. Yes. I agree with but, you, but not for the apartment building. Right. For the apartment building, you have less frontage on Mountain Road than you do on Mewburn Road. And the way that the apartment building shows, your frontage is on Mewburn Road. Yeah. I, I'm just wondering why, um, why you would be quoting the statistics based on fronting onto Mountain Road as opposed to fronting onto Mewburn Road. That's all. Yeah, it's my understanding. And Sorry? Uh, I, I, I understand that, and I know that, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I already know the answer. Well, you're allowed to have 75 on a collector. Mewburn is a collector. Mountain is an arterial. 
Okay. So, thanks. Thank you, Councillor. I've got Councillor Crater and then Cario. Thank you, Worship. Uh, first of all, thanks for your presentation. Uh, and I was pleased to see that you certainly made an effort to get out to, to meet with the residents. So, a couple short questions. Is the developer here? Uh, there are several, uh, there's a group of developers are all local individuals. Okay, so, uh, so, so there's- I didn't know who they were. So, yeah. so who is River Crest Corporation? Like, who are the people? There's probably 10 individual partners, three of whom are in the room right now, three or four. Yeah. Paul Heath, the lawyer from Niagara Falls. Uh, Jason Pizza Corolla, he's the architect. All right. So um, you got half of them are here. Thanks. So on that basis, uh, so I'm going to tell you where I'm coming from so you can understand the question I'm, I'm going to propose to you. Like for all the years I've been a city councilor, and I think many of my colleagues feel the same way when I look at development, I always try to think, what if I lived there? Like that's how I really measure everything. What if it was me and I lived at that location? For example, we just had, and some of you were here earlier, we had, uh, proposed car wash right beside some residents. Well, I went out there and took a look and said, if I lived there, I know I would not want to have a car wash right beside it. It didn't fit. And that's how I kind of look at everything. I always put myself in the residents' place. That's their home and that's their whole world. So, since there's a large number of the board of directors here for, the, for Rivercrest, can we ask them, would you consider going down to three story by a show of hands? <laughs> it's, the, it's the financial model. Yeah. It's the problem. Okay. It's problem. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. very costly to go. All right. And thanks for your sincerity. Thanks for telling me. So the answer is is no. Mm -hmm. So you realize like, what I've said to you is that that's how I measure things, rightly or wrongly. It's, if I lived there, how would I feel? And right now, being truthful, we are not calling the vote yet, but being truthful to you, uh, if I lived there, I would not be supporting it. The other issues you seem to have addressed reasonably well. The flooding, um, and we've got serious problems in the city with flooding. I've been out to Chippewa and other areas are having flooding problems. So I sure don't want people who are already occurring living mm -hmm. there having problems, and I hope we can address those. So it looks like unless we can get that down to three story, then, then I'm not going to be able to support this. So. But I appreciate it. And you, very get, you gave a very, very professional presentation. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Cario. Question was answered. Oh, was answered? Okay. Do we have any other questions of council? Councilor Ayanoni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to staff, on page three, under regional municipality of Niagara com comments, the first tat on page three, the first uh, dash is, due to the proximity of the property to agricultural lands, a sewage pumping station and the former Mountain Road landfill warning Landfill warning clauses should be inserted into the future development agreements advising purchaser, purchasers of these uses. Now, Councillor Cario said that while he's not really comfortable with the answer Mr. Holman gave in regard to flooding, neither am I, because when you speak to a lot of these residents, their homes flooded so many times their insurance will no longer cover it. So the money comes out of their own pocket or they come after us for that revenue. And we've dealt with many of those. I, my concern isn't so much the aesthetics of the four story, though three story is definitely the message we're giving you. My concern is the entire development and, the, and us being able to give a confident answer to the residents that we can assure them that there will not be continual flooding. I didn't get that from this meeting. So the apartment's not just my issue, but the, the, the chance that they could they could have the flooding again. I've been in some of their basements when the flooding was terrible, and it's devastating. And once it's happened more than a couple times, their insurance drops them. So I'd need more confidence in the proximity to the properties there, because if you have to put a warning clause there, there's something wrong. And just to that point. Yep. And, and I, I'm not supporting this application either. Thank you. Just, yes, but just to that point, Your Worship, you know, we talk about the residents there. We also have to take into consideration this huge development and these people that will purchase this. Now, this the onus is again on us, uh, responsible that we're letting them build this, and they'll all flood. So we have to address that for sure. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes, Council. And to that point, the, the couple tabs down, it says that any stormwater flows from the development does not have post-development flows. Mr. Mason talked about that. But it said potential overland flows are, be, are to be maintained on the subject lands up to the 100-year storm event. We're having 100-year storms every couple weeks. Like, we're long past worrying about a 100-year storm. We have them all the time. And we, we joke about it here, but it's no joking matter when you're in their house having to replace everything that they love. So I think this is far too risky for both the people purchasing it and the people and the neighborhood behind it. Okay. Mr. Mayor, could yes. I just address one quick yes. question? That specific uh, point you mentioned about the warning clause that relates to the noise generated by the pump station so that uh, there'll be probably windows that don't open on the west side. So it's the noise, not necessarily the capacity or any issues with the pump station itself. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions or comments of council for Mr. Yes, Councilor Kerry. Just, just a quick comment or question, Your Worship, about um, the sewage again. Uh, I understand that we don't have a whole lot to say about the provincial guidelines and the density. The only person that could have fixed that was Mr. Crater when he was back Queens Park. But it is what it is today. So my question, I guess, would be, do we not have any say on the storm or the sewer capacity? Can we not limit density based on a cushion that we insist be built in as far as runoff or storms go so that we can't just get density forced on us by the provincial policy or guidelines and then have to try and explain how the storm situation works with the residents. Do we not have any say at all about how much of a cushion we insist be built in on our flows and whether or not our systems can handle. Yes. Mr. The, the short answer is, is yes, yeah. and that's what we would be asking for in the design brief. So if your concern is more about the wet weather events, we could have them do drawdown testing to confirm the actual pump capacity, and we could do some flow monitoring to determine what impact there is from certain storm events, and make sure that they'll have at least the same level of service that we provide to other homes across the city or new development. So that's that's the target. Will we ever come up with a system that prevents basement flooding? No. We we can we'll never be able to design a system that can do that, but we can we can make sure that any new development coming in at least meets the one to five year storm return and, and allows us to uh, provide protection to those uh, that are in that immediate system. Is my, my only concern is, Mr. Holman, is to where, where people are asking for more density adjacent to people that are already having problems. Not in, in, in new construction, I'm assuming you can build in different factors, but in a situation where the people are already concerned about flooding, I, I think that I'd like to see the guidelines a little stricter before we go and increase the density because sure. the province tells us we have to. So even now, we, if we, even if we vote against this, I'm sure that if we asked our planner if these guys go to the province and take us to OMB, we don't have much of a case to win. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions or comments of council? <coughs> okay. The public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Councilor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I move that the recommendation before us be denied and that the application be denied. Okay, um, second. Okay, moved by Councilor Iannone, seconded by Councilor Crater that the recommenda recommendation, recommendation yeah, be, denied. be denied. Okay, so any questions to the, mo to the motion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Okay, and opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous. Thank you very much, Mr. Wright. Thank you. And had it been three three stories? I think it would have, yeah. yeah. I think it would have been. It would have been. Yeah, we can't do that in the fly now. Yep, no, I understand. Bring it back. Yeah. We'll bring it back. Thank you. Um, what's that? Bylaws. Ready for it? Ready for it. What's that? Oh, Mr. Clerk, are there any additional bylaws or amendments for tonight? Yes, Your Worship, uh, obviously the uh, water rate bylaw has been added to the uh, list of bylaws, so that'll be 217 
41 and the confirmatory bylaw will be 42. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange that the bylaws be given a first reading. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Bylaws 2017-35 to 2017-42, read a first time. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo to give the bylaws a second and third reading. Seconded by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay. Bylaws 2017-35 to 2017-42, read a second and third time and passed. Motion for adjournment. Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Iannone. All those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.